nothing better to do? You can squander your own time, but when it comes to my time, it's valuable. I understand that. Usually he could charm and cajole her out of any foul mood, but today she was all clouds and rain, tense, snappish, and downhearted. Belatedly remembering the flowers, he produced them from under his coat and extended them toward her. Irises and blood of Hanalea tied with a ribbon. Here, you said you liked flowers. She stared at the flowers as if astonished, then looked up into his face as if he'd been swapped out for somebody else. Another present? Well, admittedly, he wasn't the present-giving, flower-buying kind. He'd never had need of that, nor the money. Making up for lost time, he said. And, to be honest, that last present was for me as much as you. She took the flowers grudgingly and sniffed them. Thank you. Is something wrong? he asked, taking advantage of the lull in hostilities to shoulder open the door. She allowed herself to be ushered back inside. What's wrong is that you're late, she said. I'll buy you dinner after we're done, he suggested. Anywhere you want. She dumped her carry bag on a chair, then sat down at their usual work table. We'll see. First, I want to see evidence that you've read Chapter 12. Fortunately, he had read Chapter 12, which dealt with Felsian court protocol and was about as interesting as reading crop reports. But somehow, when Rebecca talked about it, it came alive. He was amazed at how much she knew about the history and inner workings of the court in Felsmarch. She quizzed him on the role of the Council of Nobles, the Wizard Council, and the Office of the Royal Steward. Some parts she had to fill in, parts that weren't in Han's books. Falk tended to focus too much on the royal family. What's the difference between the Wizard Assembly and the Wizard Council? Han asked. For instance, how do they choose the council members? Rebecca sat back, narrow-eyed, as if wondering what he meant to do with that information. The assembly is made up of all gifted citizens in the registry on Grey Lady. The council really holds all the power. The major wizard houses have vested seats on the wizard council, dating back to before the breaking, she said. The eldest gifted child of the council member replaces his or her parent unless the child steps aside. Also, there's one seat voted in by the assembly and one member chosen by the queen. The council elects the high wizard from among those on the council. If the queen dies, does the high wizard stay on? Han asked. No, Rebecca said. Each high wizard is bound to an individual queen, so when the princess heir is crowned queen, a new high wizard is named. But it isn't an inherited post, Han said. Any wizard can serve, right? Well, theoretically, Rebecca said. But most, if not all, of the high wizards have come from the vested wizard houses. Which are... It seemed that every day Han became more aware of how little he knew and how much he needed to know. The Bayars, the Mathises, the Abelards, the Griffins, Rebecca said vaguely. Some others. What keeps the High Wizard from overpowering the Queen? Han said. Magically, I mean. Rebecca's head jerked up and she stared at him. Why do you ask that? Han shrugged. Well, it stands to reason that it could be a problem. Wasn't that what happened after the invasion? She licked her lips. The binding is supposed to prevent that. What do you mean is supposed to, Han said, catching an odd inflection. Rebecca shifted her gaze away. The binding does control the High Wizard, she said, nodding as if to reassure herself. The speakers conduct a ceremony that binds the High Wizard both to the Queen's will and to the good of the Queendom. Han tapped the cover of his book. It says in here the High Wizard serves as a counselor to the Queen on magical matters, represents her to the Wizard Council, and uses magic to support and protect the army, the realm, and the throne. Rebecca nodded, her shoulders slumping a little, the curtain of her hair obscuring her face. That's right. 
But he's not in charge, Han said. The queen's in charge, right? She nodded. The queen rules alone. Queens of the Fells are forbidden to marry wizards, and even the man she marries takes the title of consort only. But there used to be wizard kings, Han persisted, right? Right, she said, but not since the breaking. After the kings nearly destroyed the world, they decided it was a bad idea. She reached for Han's book, seeming eager to change the subject. I had no idea you were so interested in politics. Now, let's review the rules surrounding royal succession and accomplishments of some specific queens. How can you remember all those names? Han said. My family's been at the court for generations, you know, Rebecca said. Some of it had to soak in. You've heard those songs, haven't you, that name off the Grey Wolf Queens in order? Actually, he knew some drinking songs that named off the Queens, but they didn't bear repeating to a blue blood. I don't have to memorize them, do I? he asked. I'd just as soon skip over that. To tell the truth, I don't give a rat's arse about the Queens. She flinched as if he'd slapped her. All right, but I just thought... The queens, the nobility, the whole lot. They're just bloodsuckers feeding off the people. They don't care at all what happens in the streets. You don't know that, Rebecca said, color staining her pale cheeks. You don't know anything about Queen Mariana and what she... You're the one that doesn't know anything, Han said. Forgive me for being a cynic, but I know how people are treated outside of the castle close. What makes you think I don't, Rebecca said, her voice rising. I was in Southbridge Guardhouse, remember? I saw how you'd been beaten. I saw what happened to your friends. But you can't think the Queen had any... Han plowed right over her words. The Queen has had everything to do with every bad thing that's happened to me in the past year. Rasa sat frozen, her green eyes fixed on his face, speechless for once. Why are you telling her this, Alistair? Han thought. Just shut it. Not the way to follow up on flowers. But he opened his mouth, and the story came pouring out. Me and my mam and little sister lived over a stable in Ragmarket, he said. My mam did washing for the queen until she was dismissed for ruining one of her dresses. I'd given up thieving, so we had no money at all. That was the start of it. Rebecca leaned forward, lacing her fingers together. I never realized that your mother worked for the queen, she said. Perhaps, perhaps there's a way to get her reinstated. I know some people and... Han shook his head. Don't try and fix this. It's not fixable. Just listen. The queen's responsible for public works, right? For the water supply and like that? Well, the wells went bad in Rag Market, and my sister, Mary, caught the fever. While I was out trying to get the money to buy some medicine for her, the Blue Jackets came looking for me, thinking I was the one who hushed the Southies that died. When they didn't find me, they set fire to the stable with Mam and Mary inside. What? Rebecca whispered, her face now gone ashen. They burnt to death, Rebecca, Han said, his voice low and fierce. And the Blue Jackets did it on the Queen's orders. Mary was seven years old. She stared at him, shaking her head. Oh, no, she whispered. No, that can't be true. Her mouth formed the word no, even when no sound came out. You said the Queen's in charge. Ha knew he should stop, but he'd had this stuffed up in his heart so long that it was like the floodgates had opened. After that, somebody came back and murdered the Raggers and the Southies. Some of them were Litlings, too. The ones you saved from Southbridge Guardhouse? They're all dead. Tears pooled in Rebecca's eyes. So, Sari and Velvet and Flynn are... All dead, far as I know, Han said. Cat's the only one that escaped. It was all just a waste? Rebecca's voice wavered. Why didn't you tell me about your family and, and everything? 
You never asked, Hans said. People die in Rag Market and Southbridge every day. They don't count in the blue blood world. It's just one more sad story. But we're not all like that, she said, her lower lip trembling. Course not, he snorted. Her bloody highness, the princess heir, tosses her pin money our way, and we're supposed to get down on our knees and thank her. That's not what she wants, Rebecca whispered, looking stricken. She's not looking for gratitude. She just... Of course you'd stick up for her, Han said. Blue bloods always stick together. This time, Rebecca didn't try to respond. She sat, twisting a gold ring on her forefinger, staring straight ahead, her face as pale as scribe's paper. As silence grew between them, guilt crept over Han. Of course she'd defend them. She'd grown up in the court, and her friends were bluebloods. She wasn't the enemy. Look, I'm sorry, Han said. I didn't mean to jump all over you. You may be a blue blood, but you're not to blame for what happened. He closed his hand over hers. None of what he said seemed to make her feel any better. It wasn't her fault that his life was a disaster. He was trying to figure out a way to say that when she slammed her chair back, nearly toppling it, and stood. I have to go. She snatched up her bag. Please accept my sincere condolences at the loss of your family, she said, voice hitching. I am so very sorry. She flung herself out the door as if she were being chased by demons, leaving her flowers behind. He heard her banging down the steps, then nothing. He sat frozen with surprise for a moment. Rebecca, he shouted, wait. He scraped together his books and papers and stuffed them into his carry bag, then launched himself down the stairs. By the time he reached the common room, Rebecca was gone. The patrons stared at Han with greedy interest. He ran out onto Bridge Street, looking both directions, and saw her, head down, striding back toward Wean House and her dormitory. He raced after her, dodging students and faculty who strolled the streets, enjoying the spring weather. His long legs proved an advantage, that and the fact that Rebecca was crying flat out and probably couldn't see where she was going. Han caught up with her and took hold of her arm. Rebecca, please, please, don't run off, he said. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said the things I did. She just shook her head. Her eyes squeezed tightly shut as if she could make him disappear. Tears leaked out of the corners of her eyes and rolled down her cheeks. Leave me alone. I'm going back to my room. But she made no move to do so, just stood in the middle of the street, fists clenched, while the crowds parted on either side of her, staring and nudging each other. Come on, he said, sliding an arm around her shoulder and guiding her back toward the bridge. He looked up at the sign that swung over the doorway. The scholar and hound. Let's go in here. She didn't say yes, but she didn't say no either, so he herded her through the door and into the warmly lit interior. It was crowded, but he spotted two bleary-eyed students leaving a table in the corner. He shouldered his way through the standees and claimed it, staring down a hulking cadet in a beer-stained tunic lurching toward it. The girlie needs to sit down, Han said. Back off. The cadet backed off, peppering him with black looks. Han settled Rebecca into a chair facing the corner to make her tear-stained face less apparent. He sat facing the room, his usual position, and motioned to the server. He held up two fingers and tapped his midsection, and she nodded, moving off toward the kitchen. Han looked back at Rebecca. She'd undergone a transformation. She'd wiped the tears from her face, and the ragged quality was gone from her breathing. Even her hair was in better order. Her cheeks and the tip of her nose were still pink, or Han would have never known she'd been crying. She tapped into that steel core of hers, pulled herself together, and put on a street face to hide the misery within. The girlie's tough for a blue blood, Han thought. 
Maybe tough enough to be with me. Maybe something's eating at her. Should it worry me that she's so good at keeping secrets? I'm sorry, she said. I didn't mean to fall apart like that. I just... I have a lot on my mind already, and it's just... When I heard about your family and... and the raggers, I just felt like everything I'd done or tried to do was a waste of time. It ambushes me, too, Han said. It's like getting run over by an ox cart. How do you even stand it? She studied his face like she really wanted to know. I don't have much choice, do I? He shrugged, thinking that, in a way, it helped to share the secret eating at him. It was like lancing a boil. It relieved the pain and pressure. But I'm not lying down for it. That's why I'm here. For next time. She frowned, biting her lip. What do you... She jumped and looked up as the server set mugs of cider in front of them, along with steaming bowls of stew. I hope stew is all right, Han said. I haven't had anything to eat all day. Stew's good. I haven't eaten either. She stared down at her dinner, but made no move to take a bite. Meaning to teach by example, Han spooned up some stew. It's good, he said with his mouth full. Sorry, he said wiping his mouth with a napkin. Sometimes, when he was tired, he just couldn't play the blue blood role. I can't make you, Rebecca, but you'll probably feel better if you eat. She nodded mechanically and took a bite, and then another. Once she got started, she finished it off, washing it down with cider until that too was gone. You said you had things on your mind, Han said once she'd dropped her spoon into her bowl. What's going on? She rubbed her temples with the tips of her fingers. I just don't know what to do. I feel like I should go back home. I... My mother needs me. Why? Is she sick? Han asked, ordering another cider. Well, Rebecca said, not exactly, but she's not herself. And even when she is herself, she's... Her voice trailed off, as if she suddenly realized she'd said too much. So she's asked you to come home? No, Rebecca said. She told me to stay away. But she may not be thinking clearly, and it may not be in my best interest to stay away. Well, Han said. Mind, I don't know anything about your family. But being here at Odin's Ford, this is a real opportunity for you, isn't it? She nodded pushing her empty mug away and pulling Han's full one toward her. Better go easy on that, Han thought. Cider isn't strong drink, but you're a small person. Isn't there anyone else you can talk to and find out what's going on? Han asked. What about your father? Well, he and my mother don't always get on, she said. And he's away a lot on business. Brothers and sisters? I have a sister, Rebecca said but I think she might be part of the problem. She paused. I'm afraid I'll lose everything if I don't go back now. Han frowned, confused. Then it came to him. Families like Rebecca's, they had legacies. You mean they might cut you off? Disinherit you? She nodded. Maybe. It's a possibility. Han's instincts said she wasn't telling him everything. It was like peering through a keyhole into a room you wanted to break into. You could see some of what was going on, but there might be a nasty surprise waiting in the part of the room you couldn't see. I don't know that I can give you advice, he said, and I don't know what you stand to lose. He reached out and fingered a tendril of her hair. If you don't know what your mother wants, you should think about what you want and the best way to go after it whether it's staying here or going back and getting things straight with your mother. Rebecca's face went all cloudy again. It's not about what I want, she said. I have a lot of other people depending on me. Why can't it be about what you want? Sometimes, anyway, Hans said, closing his hand over hers. You just got to, you just have to claim it. I've learned that nobody's going to hand you anything. 
You don't get what you don't go after. She looked down at their joined hands. I don't know whom to trust, she whispered. Trust me, he said, leaning across the table and kissing her. The fact was, he wanted Rebecca to stay in Odin's Ford, and it wasn't just that he was learning things from her he wouldn't learn anywhere else. She was prickly and proud, used to ordering people around and getting her own way. She was smart and opinionated. She could talk the tail off a dog. But she was fiercely kind-hearted. She'd cross the street to give a coin to a beggar and always backed the underdog in any fight. She'd shed tears over Mam and Mary, though she'd never even met them. She demanded a lot, but demanded even more from herself. He still held her hand within his, rubbing his thumb over her palm. Her hands were remarkably small, but calloused. Hands that weren't afraid of hard work. She wore a heavy gold ring on her forefinger, engraved with circling wolves. Han wanted to see one of those smiles that lit up her eyes. He wanted to see her happy again. He wanted to be the one who made her happy. He wanted Rebecca Morley in every way. He'd been living like a dedicate for months. In the end, he walked Rebecca all the way back to Grindel Hall. She was stumble-step sleepy more than anything else, and this time he'd make sure she got home all right. It wasn't quite curfew when they arrived at her dormitory. Han meant to deliver Rebecca and take his leave at the door, but the common room was empty. Where's your dorm master? he asked. If he'd showed up at Hampton with a girlie on his arm, Blevins would have been all over them already. Don't have one, Rebecca mumbled, yawning. Just Eamon. I mean, Commander Byrne. Where's he? Rebecca rubbed her temples with the heel of her hand. Probably already in bed, or over at the temple school visiting Anamaya. She said this without emotion. The dormitory had a definite military look about it. For one thing, it was much more orderly than Hampton Hall. Who else stays here? Han asked. The rest of my triple, Rebecca said. She took his hand and tugged him toward the stairs. Come up with me? Han hesitated, his heart hammering out a yes. Are you sure? I don't want to get you into trouble. It's all right, she said her face pinking up a bit. I room with Hallie and Talia. Talia will be glad to see you. She's been playing matchmaker, you know. Hallie just got back from the fells. If she's still awake, she can tell us the news from home. Well, Han thought, I do want to hear the news. They climbed the narrow stairs, still holding hands, up and up, past the snores emanating from the second-floor sleeping quarters to the third-floor landing. Here there was a small sitting room with a cluster of chairs around a fireplace. An arched doorway led into an adjacent room. It was the kind of place the commander should have, or the dorm master. This puts Hampton to shame, Han said, looking around. Rebecca laughed. It's supposed to be for the dorm master. There are three female cadets in Grindel, so we share it. She pushed open the door to the bedroom, calling, Hallie? Talia? Han hoped they weren't already asleep in there. He hoped they weren't there at all. She motioned him forward. They're not here. Han hesitated in the doorway, looking around. Three single beds were lined up against the wall, each made up with military precision, each with a large trunk at the foot of the bed. Three study desks had been jammed in under the window for the best light. Rebecca's familiar book bag lay on one desk, with her writing implements laid out next to it and the music box centered in a position of honor on the blotter. This is posh, Han said. So much for the rough life in the military. Rebecca's purple scarf dangled from a hook by the door. She hung her bag next to it and held out her hand for Hans. You sure I shouldn't get going, he said, handing it over. It's nearly curfew. What was the matter with him? He was never this well-behaved.
Rebecca sat down on her bed, practically bouncing on the taut coverlet. She patted the bedclothes beside her. He sat down next to her, sliding his arms around her. He kissed her, and she drew back in surprise, pressing her fingers to her lips, eyes wide. Your lips seem to be quite potent tonight. Sorry, Han said. He took hold of his amulet and allowed power to flow into it. Let's try again. Gingerly, he pressed his lips against hers, eyes open for her reaction. That's better, she said, winding her arms around his neck. She lay back, pulling him down beside her, pressing against him. He kissed her again, then began working at the buttons of her uniform jacket. He was glad he hadn't joined the army after all. The military was entirely too fond of buttons. You know, I've never had a girlie say that to me before, Han murmured, sliding her jacket from her shoulders and tossing it aside. That my lips were potent. I say that to all the wizards I kiss, she said. I think you should know. I see, he said, trying hard not to wonder what wizards she'd been kissing. Not Micah Bayar, he thought. Don't let it be Bayar. What's it like? he asked. What do you mean, what's it like? She squinted at him suspiciously. Being kissed by a wizard. Why, haven't you been? she asked, looking surprised. There was Fiona. Han pushed that out of his mind. Being kissed by a wizard when you're not one, I mean. Hmm. Rebecca scrunched up her face, thinking. It's kind of a sizzling sting that goes all the way into your throat, like brandy going down. Han pressed his fingers against his own mouth. Like brandy? Really? And sometimes it goes to your head and... Her voice trailed off and her eyes narrowed. Blood of the demon, she growled, readjusting her shirt. Don't make fun of me. No, no, Han said, snorting with laughter. I want to know. This is fascinating. Picking up her pillow, she smacked him with it. There ensued a wrestling match that destroyed the well-made bed and was nearly Han's undoing several times. They ended up flushed and laughing, entwined with each other. Putting one hand on the back of her neck and the other at her waist, he kissed her again, long and slow, since he'd been a long time between kisses, and he didn't know when he'd get back to it again. He planted quick kisses along Rebecca's jawline, slid her shirt from her shoulders, and kissed her bare skin, raising goose flesh. She wore a silk camisole under the shirt. He couldn't help noticing the small rose tattooed above her left breast. He sat back for a moment, trying to slow his breathing, to control the pounding cadence of his heart. Easy, Alistair. Just because you're eager doesn't mean she is. Rebecca, he said, resting his forehead against hers. Can we lock the door? Like I said, when I put things aside for the future, they disappear on me. I know, she said, but I just... Things are already complicated enough. I'm not taking maidenweed, and I don't know where to get any around here, and Hallie and Talia could be back any time. As if to put the lie to the words, she reached out and untied the neck of his shirt, fumbling with the buttons, sliding her hands inside, caressing his skin. Before he knew it, she was fingering his amulet. This is so beautiful, she whispered, as the peace kindled in her hand. It burned with a greenish light, seeming to make her skin translucent. I never realized, Rebecca, Han said, pushing her hand away. Don't. Light and power exploded between them with a loud crack, leaving Han's ears ringing and Rebecca sucking on her fingers. Are you all right? Han said anxiously, taking her hand. Did it burn you or? Rebecca shook her head. It didn't even hurt. I... Feet pounded up the stairs. The door slammed open, and Corporal Eamon Byrne stood in the doorway, shirtless, breathing hard, sword drawn. Blood of the demon, Han swore, rolling to his feet. Get away from her, Byrne shouted, advancing with the sword. Han backed away. 
Burns stood between him and the door, but the window was behind him. Re Rebecca, are you all right? Byrne asked, continuing to advance until he was between Han and Rebecca. I'm fine, Eamon, Rebecca said, looking from one to the other. Listen, this is all just a... What's up, sir? Three more disheveled cadets peered in at the doorway. When they saw Byrne with his sword drawn, holding Han at bay, they crammed through the doorway like pigs through a gate. Take Morley downstairs and stow her someplace safe, Byrne said, never taking his eyes off Han. And find her a shirt. Commander Byrne, Rebecca shouted, standing in her camisole as if she were the general of all the armies. Stop it at once! Han Alistair is my guest! Han knew next to nothing about military matters, but he had to think that cadets weren't allowed to shout at their commanders, let alone order them around. Byrne looked from Han to Rebecca and back again. He looked lost for a moment, then his resolve seemed to harden. Cadet Morley, you know that guests are not allowed in Grindle Hall after curfew. I order you to go immediately to the common room and await disciplinary action while I deal with your guest. Han didn't like his chances with Corporal Byrne. That's all right, Corporal Commander, he said. No need to deal with me. Good to see you again. I was just going. Han, Rebecca said. Wait, you don't have to go. I always say yes to the man with the sword, Han said. By now, his backside was pressed against the window frame. Turning, he pushed open the shutters. Gripping the top of the window frame, he swung his legs up and through the opening, praying there was a gable below. Looking down, he saw a peaked roof a story beneath him and let go. He landed gracelessly, twisting his ankle and skinning his palms. At least he didn't punch clean through the roof. I'll see you Thursday, Rebecca shouted out the window. His cloak landed next to him on the tiles. Shrugging into it, Han took off, limping across the roof to the connecting gallery. Above him, he heard the shutters slam shut. His mind raced faster than he could travel on foot. There was something more there than a commander's concern for curfew or the virtue of one of his cadets. Did Byrne want it all, both Anamaya and Rebecca? He didn't seem the type to be so greedy, but Han didn't know him all that well. Could Rebecca have used Han to make Byrne jealous? If so, she was willing to go pretty far to make a point. Cynical and streetwise as he was, he couldn't believe that. Han laughed, shaking his head. Poor Alistair, you may be a thief and a street lord and a rogue. You may be a legend of sorts in rag market, but you're a babe in the woods among these blue bloods. When it came down to it, even if he'd been played, he had no cause to complain. It wasn't like Rebecca had made him any promises. It wasn't like she'd made any claims on him either. They'd kissed, danced a few dances, had a pillow fight. He'd really enjoyed that kissing, though. Wanted more, in fact. He carried the memory of her touch on his skin. She stirred him up more than any girly in memory. Corporal Byrne had ruined Han's evening, but he had a feeling he'd returned the favor. The thought cheered him. See you Thursday, she'd said. You don't get what you don't go after, he'd said. Somewhere nearby, temple bells bonged out midnight. He'd hoped his ankle would loosen up, but instead it seemed to stiffen as he hobbled along. That would make it difficult to outrun the provost guards if they spotted him. So he kept to the side streets and shadows as best he could. He crossed the bridge, avoiding the guards searching out stragglers. As he wound his way toward Hampton, the back of his neck prickled, as though someone were watching him. Once he spun around, hearing a footstep behind him, but he saw nothing and no one. Surely Byrne wouldn't send anyone after him to exact revenge, Han thought. Nah. Byrne was an honorable sort, full of scruples. Besides, maybe he and Rebecca were busy kissing and making up. Jealousy twanged through him. 
When Han reached Mistwork Hall, he chose not to cross the open quad, where he might be spotted, but kept close to the building, using it as cover as he threaded his way closer to Hampton. Maybe he'd go up over the roof again. He'd been through enough drama. He didn't want to deal with any more. Han turned down the cobbled pathway that led to the back gardens. There was a hidden corner between the buildings that offered good handholds for climbing. Han wedged one boot into a crevice and reached high, gripping the rough stones on either side. He hoped his ankle wouldn't give him trouble on the high road. At that moment, someone behind him said, Keep your hands where they are. I got a blade, and I'll use it. The voice was low and rough. Whoever it was, he was smart enough not to touch Han, and so give away his position. What do you want? Han asked, thinking that if idiocy were a capital crime, he might soon pay the price. You got a purse on you? Han did have a purse on him, but he didn't want to give it up. Nuh-uh, Han said. It's nearly end of term. I'm flat broke. Liar. A whisper of air, his ears stung, and then blood trickled down his neck. The thief had sliced his earlobe with a blade so sharp he'd scarcely felt it. Your purse, the thief repeated, or next I cut off your hand. His voice shook a little, like he was nervous. He sounded young, too. That wasn't reassuring. A nervous larceneur with a sharp blade was dangersome. And Han wouldn't be quick on his feet, with his ankle unreliable as it was. All right, I got a purse, Han admitted. You want me to fetch it out? He didn't plan on making any sudden moves. Tell me where it is, the thief said. It's in a pouch slid onto my belt, tucked into my breeches in front, Han said. It was a thief's carry, where a slide hander or pickpocket was least likely to dive unnoticed. If the thief went fishing for it, it might provide an opening, at least. But the larsener didn't go for it. Han felt the whisper of steel sliding close, and his cloak slid to the ground, sliced through down the back and across the shoulders. That was smart, getting all that fabric out of the way first. He hoped this street lifter didn't plan on slicing his breeches off, too. What's that around your neck? the thief asked. Han's amulet glowed faintly, illuminating the dark corner in front of him. Nothing, Han said, tilting his head down to cover it. Just something I bought on the streets, for the festival. It lights up. Looks pricey to me, the larsener said. Like it might be worth real money. I'll sell it to you, Han said. Paid a five penny for it. I'll sell it for a girly. You have a death wish, he thought, wishing he could suck the words back down. The clan's great wizard champion would die sliced up by a street larsener. Abelard's assassin would fall to a common rusher. Take it off and toss it back toward me, the larsener said. Move slow. Look, Han said. How about I toss you my purse instead? My girlie gave me this neck piece, and she'll skin me alive if I lose it. If he reached into his britches, he could fetch out his own knife. I'll skin you alive if you don't give it here, the thief said. All right, I'm unfastening it now. Here I go. Han slowly lowered his arms from the wall and reached to the back of his neck, fumbling with the clasp on the chain. He wondered how much power was left in the flash piece, if it would distract his attacker enough so Han could chance a move on him. It had reacted to Rebecca, anyway. Lift the chain over your head, the thief said. You don't got to unfasten it. How does he know that, Han thought, unless the whole point of this shoulder tap was to get hold of the jinx piece. Fear snaked down between his shoulder blades. Han lifted the chain over his head. He palmed the amulet, feeling it vibrate faintly at his touch. Not much to work with. He started to turn. Don't turn round, the larsener said sharply. Just give it a toss over your shoulder. Yes, there was something familiar about the voice. Han tossed the amulet over his left shoulder with his right hand. 
As the piece flew past his ear, he kept turning, yanking his knife from his waist. As he'd expected, the larsener was momentarily distracted, his gaze following the falling star of the amulet. Han launched himself toward the rusher, slamming his shoulder into him with all his weight behind it. The thief fell, striking his head on the stone wall. He fell flat on his face on the cobblestones, his arms stretched out in front of him, knocked out cold. Han looked down at him. He was dressed all in black, with narrow black trousers, black boots, and a hooded jacket that fit close to his slender body. Dressed like an assassin. So why hadn't he just cut Han's throat and robbed his body at his leisure? The whole thing had gone down almost silently. Han grabbed up his amulet and dropped the chain over his head, keeping it in his hand. He stood in a half-crouch with his knife in his other hand, expecting to see the thief's accomplices running at him. But a single figure detached itself from the shadows at the side of the building and came toward him. Keep back, Han said, waving the knife, or I'll stick you and your friend. Don't kill her, Dancer said, stepping into the light that leaked onto the path from the street. We need to find out why she did it and who she's working for. Her? Han slumped back against the wall, his knife dangling loosely, his head spinning. This is a dream, he thought. Dancer knelt next to the prone larsener and relieved her of her knife. He gently turned the body over. It was Cat Tyburn. Chapter 30 This Rough Magic Mick and Garrett took hold of Race's arms, trying to tug her out of the room while Han backed toward the window. Eamon advanced on him, sword extended. That's all right, Corporal, Han said. No need to deal with me. Good to see you again. I was just going. His gaze met Race's for a long moment, his blue eyes hard and brilliant as sapphires. He turned, jerked open the shutters, and slid feet first through the window like an eel. Dropping his sword, Eamon leaped forward, grabbing at him, but missed. Pulling free from Mick and Garrett, Raysa ran to the window and pushed in next to Eamon. He seized her arm like he thought she might jump out after Han. She leaned out of the window in time to see Han limping across the gallery roof, away from them. I'll see you Thursday, Raysa shouted after him. She grabbed his cloak from the hook and tossed it through the window. Han scooped it up and walked on, not looking back when Eamon slammed the shutters closed. All right, Eamon said. He's gone. The rest of you, out. I want to speak with Morley in private. If Abbott and Talbot come back, keep them downstairs. Mick and Garrett gave Raysa sympathetic looks before they trooped out of the room. Raysa heard their boots on the stairs, then silence. Raysa leaned her hip on the window ledge and glared daggers at Eamon Byrne. He glared thunderclouds back. Each waited for the other to begin. Finally, Eamon gave in. Did you really ask Cuffs Alistair up to your room? Han, she said. What? He goes by Han Alistair now. Eamon rolled his eyes. Han Alistair, then. What of it? Raysa said, furious and embarrassed and frustrated all at once. You know what the rules are, Eamon said. Just because we don't have a dorm master doesn't mean they're not enforced. No guests are allowed on the second and third floors. No guests at all after curfew. I promised Tame Askell that... Tame Askell has nothing to do with this and you know it, Raysa said. If you'd found a girl hiding in Mick's room, you'd not have driven her off with a sword. If he was snuggling with a known thief and gang leader, maybe I would, Eamon said especially if that thief had already abducted him at knife point and held him captive overnight. Especially if that thief had suddenly turned into a wizard. He thrust his head forward like a turtle from its shell. As a matter of fact, I'd be seriously wondering if Mick had lost his wits. I know what I'm doing, Raysa said, pulling her shirt on. 
It's not like I've tried to keep it a secret or anything. I told you he was here at Odin's Ford. Just stop talking, Raisa thought. There's no reason you should feel guilty. You said you wouldn't pretend not to know him, Eamon said. You didn't tell me you were going to... to... He waved his hand, taking in the rumpled bed. Ray, you hardly know him. And what you do know is no recommendation. I know more about him than you think, Raisa said. I've been tutoring him for months. Tutoring him? Eamon raised his eyebrows. Is that what you were doing? He snatched up his sword and rammed it home in his scabbard like he was skewering an enemy, muttering something about tutoring. What was that? Raisa said. What did you say? I said, if you were tutoring him, what was the bloody subject? None of your business, she said. Anyway, every other night you're crossing the river to be with Anamaya. That's different. We're not... Again, he waved a hand at Raisa's bed. Raisa put her hands on her hips. Do you even want to? You shouldn't be marrying someone you aren't in love with. Well, I don't have much choice, do I? He sat down on the edge of the hearth and put his head in his hands. Raisa stared at him for a long moment, then went and sat next to him on the hearth. She put her hand on his knee. I know, she said. I'm sorry. Neither of us can quit being what we are, Eamon said through his fingers. You're supposed to pretend that I'm your commander, but as soon as I give you an order, you turn into the princess heir. Meanwhile, the rest of the wolves are watching. Should I blame them if they begin to think that the orders I give are optional? I'm sorry, Raisa said again, but it doesn't help when you evict my guests at sword point. Eamon dropped his hands into his lap, fingering his wolf ring. He looked over at her, his gray eyes dark with pain. I have no right to ask this, but what's between you and Alistair? Is it... is it just a fling, or... It's not to get back at you if that's what you're asking, Raisa snapped. Eamon's cheeks flushed red. I wasn't suggesting... It was tempting, but no, Raisa said. She thought for a long moment. I don't know what to say. He's brilliant, and he doesn't let me get away with anything. I've learned so much from him. I think he makes me a better person. Eamon rolled his eyes. It sounds like he's your priest, not your lover. He's not my lover, Raisa retorted. Well, not exactly. Not exactly, or not yet. Eamon. Eamon rubbed his eyes wearily. By the lady, Raisa, I'm doing the best I can. I know. Raisa bit her lip. What could she tell him? I notice everything about him, from his flawed nose to his battle scars, to his eyes as blue as an upland lake at midsummer. Sometimes I see the boy he would have been had it not been for his life in Ragmarket. He wears his pain on his face in unguarded moments. At other times, I can see just how dangerous he is. No, she couldn't say any of that. I'm going to the cadet's ball with him, Raisa said. Just so you know. Ray, Eamon said, taking her hands in his. Whatever you do, don't fall in love with him. Raisa nodded, knowing it was already too late. Chapter 31 Betrayal Sitting back on his heels on the cobblestones, Han stared down at Kat. A purple bruise bloomed over her right eye where it had struck the wall. Her brow bone puffed out, making her face lopsided. A little different angle, and she might have put her eye out. He looked up at Dancer. Did you know she was stalking me? He demanded. Shh! Dancer put a finger to his lips, looking up and down the pathway. I knew she was up to something, so I followed her, Dancer said. I wouldn't have let her cut your throat or anything. That's reassuring. Han stood and scooped up his ruined cloak. When did you plan to step in? Let's get her inside before the provost guard shows, 
Dancer said. Why should we? Let him take her to jail, Han said. I'm done. Han had been blindsided by someone he'd considered to be a friend. He'd never have expected her to try a stab and grab on him. After all that had happened, he was at his limit. Dancer didn't honor that with an answer. Come on, he said. We can't drag her over the roof and through the window. I'll carry her. You go in front and distract Blevins if he's awake. Dancer stowed Cat's blade away and slid his hands under her, lifting her. She groaned, but didn't open her eyes. Han walked into the dormitory ahead of them, scouting the common room for Blevins. The dorm master was sound asleep in his chair next to the fire, waiting up for them. He'd be peeved not to catch them sneaking in after curfew. Han motioned Dancer forward, and they soft-footed past Blevins and climbed the stairs, keeping to the outsides of the treads so they didn't squeak. Fortunately, they reached the fourth floor without meeting anyone. Han pushed his door open, and Dancer followed him in, depositing Cat on Han's bed. I'll get some cold water for her head, Dancer said. He picked up the basin and left, heading for the third floor washroom. He's awfully considerate of someone who cut up my good cloak and threatened me with a knife a few minutes ago, Han thought. Han lit two candles to drive off the shadows. The dawn was still hours away. Cat groaned, pressing her hands to her forehead. Han patted her down thoroughly, removing three more knives. Dancer returned with the basin, wet a rag, and laid it over the lump on Cat's head. She reached up and yanked it off and he replaced it again. She batted his hand away and opened her eyes. Get away from me, you dung-eating cop! She stopped abruptly, as memory seemed to flood back in. Blood and bones, she whispered. Focusing on Han's face, she flinched and closed her eyes again. Why didn't you kill me? She whispered, licking her lips. I might still, Han said. But Dancer thought you'd have something to say first. I got nothing to say, Cat whispered. Just cut my throat and be done with it. She tilted her head back, exposing her throat, a wolf submitting to the alpha of the pack. Dancer sat down on the bed next to her. No, you saved our lives in Arden. You deserve a hearing. I want to know what's wrong with you. These past few weeks, you've seemed different, kind of desperate. What are you talking about? Han said irritably. You hardly know her, so I don't know how you could- You're never around, Dancer said. You have no idea what's going on with your friends. Han waved a hand at Cat. This is a friend? He rolled his eyes. Friends don't hush friends in back alleys. Cuffs is right, Cat said, opening her eyes and looking at Dancer. You don't know me very well. I'm a thief. I betray my friends. I deserve to die. Tears gathered at the corners of her eyes and trickled into her hair on either side. I should have just left, but I needed money to get home, she said. There's nothing for me here. I'm not cut out to be in school. What did you want with the amulet? Han asked, a terrible suspicion growing in his mind. If you needed money... You should have taken my purse. I wasn't going to go poking around in your breeches for it, Cat said. For all I knew, you had a stash of weapons in there. You were after the amulet all along, Han said. Weren't you? After a long pause, she nodded. I thought I could sell it, Cat said. You acted like it was valuable, and you always kept it with you, so I had to take it off you. Han blinked as the puzzle piece fell into place. You were the one who tossed my room, he said. You were looking for it. I didn't never toss your room, Cat flared. When Han raised an eyebrow, she mumbled, How'd you know? I put everything back where it was. It was the night of the Dean's dinner, so you knew neither of us would be here, Dancer said. He was looking at Cat, and she was looking at him. And Han suddenly felt like he was an outsider, 
just a bystander in the room. I, I came here because I thought I could help, she said, keeping her eyes locked on Dancer's face as if she were witch-fixed. I felt bad. I thought I could make up for what happened in Felsmarch. She swallowed hard. I should have stayed away. What do you mean, what happened in Felsmarch? Dancer asked, his voice low and soothing, like a witch talker. To Cuffs, to Mam and his sister, to... to the Ragus, Cat whispered. Dancer removed the rag, re-soaked it, wrung it out, and replaced it. Why did you feel that you had to make up for it? He asked. Cat jerked the rag off her forehead and flung it away. Because it was my fault. Hans stared at her. Cat had a lot to answer for, but he wasn't going to let her take the blame for that. No, he said. That one is mine. My fault. He remembered how distraught Cat had been the night of the fire, how she and the other raggers had kept him from going into the stable after Mam and Mary. She had saved his life that night, too. There's no way you could have saved them, if that's what you're thinking, he said, softening a bit. You can't blame yourself. She just shook her head. You don't know nothing. She sat up then, swaying, looking like she might topple back over. Dancer put an arm around her to steady her, and for once, she didn't jerk away. Who did you think you could sell it to? Han asked. The amulet, I mean. Cat rolled her eyes as if Han were an idiot. The Bayar jinxling I came to see me a few weeks ago. He threatened me. He said he'd tell on me if I didn't steal the jinx piece back for him. He said it was his to start with, that you'd taken it from him. That would have been after Bayar and his cousins had been evicted from Hampton. After the dean had told Bayar to back off. Something was missing. Something Cat was talking around, but not saying. What was Bayar going to tell me? Han asked. What didn't you want me to know? Cat took a deep breath, and the words came out in a rush, like she'd been waiting forever to confess. It was me she said. I was the one who told the young Bayar where you lived when they were hunting you in Rag Market. They took Velvet. They'd said they'd killed him if I didn't tell, so I did. I figured it was him or you, and I loved Velvet, and I didn't love you. I figured they'd toss the place, find whatever it was you'd stole from them, and that would be that. I never thought, I never expected they'd... Her voice broke, and tears streamed down her cheeks. You never thought they'd burn up Mam and Mary. Han said. He backed away from Cat until he came up against the wall. He flattened himself against it, wishing he could disappear, that he could just blink out like a cinder so he wouldn't have to hear any more. Tears pricked at his eyes. You didn't know who you were dealing with. I found out, she said, her voice bitter as chicory. They killed Velvet anyway. Then they come and killed everyone else. It was a slaughter. They were looking for you, trying to make somebody tell where you were. I'd be dead myself if I was there. She took a shuddering breath. I wish I had been. Han should have known all along. He'd thought it was Taz Macney, but no. It made sense that he'd been betrayed by someone close to him. Someone who could direct the Queen's Guard through the maze of streets in Ragmarket, who could point out the stable in a place with no numbers and no names written down. After, I wanted to kill them, Cat said. I wanted to kill everyone. She smiled sourly. I always thought I was good with a blade, but I'm smart enough to know that as a killer, I'm nothing next to them. It'd be like throwing myself into the fire. I still would have done it if I thought I could take a few of them with me. So. I took Jemson's offer to go to Odin's Ford. I never wanted to see Rag Market again. I got as far as Delphi, then I just got stuck. I was too scared to go on, and I couldn't go back. When I ran into you, when I found out you were still alive, I got this idea that maybe it wouldn't be so bad being in the South if you was there. I knew you'd get on wherever you went. You were the best street lord I ever knew. 
But I knew if you ever found out I was the one that cackled on you, you'd cut my heart out. She looked at Han, rather hopefully. So, kill me. You got rights. That way I wouldn't have to keep thinking about things I should have done different. Han slid down the wall until his backside hit the floor. He pulled his knees up and wrapped his arms around them. He felt numb. He'd been nursing his guilt for so long, he wasn't about to hand any piece of it to Cat. I'm not going to kill you, Cat, he said. I'm sorry about that, but I'm not. You just got in the way when the Bayars came after me, that's all. You and everybody else. That's what I'll be carrying for the rest of my life. They all sat in silence for a while. What now? Dancer said to no one in particular. He took Kat's hand and cradled it in his. Again, she didn't resist. I'll go away if that's what you want, Kat said. You'd be a fool to trust me ever again, and you've never been a fool. She looked up at him. But I want to stay and help you. I know who you're up against, and I promise I'll do whatever you say. No, Dancer said. This is our fight. We can't avoid it, but you're not in it. I am too in it, Cat snarled. For Velvet and Jonas and Sweets and Sari and everybody else. Mary was just a baby, and they burned up. Stop it, Han said, putting up his hand. I just... stop it. He waited until he thought he could control his voice. I'm going to be in a war pretty soon. Likely against the Bayars and a lot of other charm casters, he said. It'll be something different than what you're used to. It's not just a street fight, though there might be some of that. It'll be politics and spying and putting a word in where it'll do the most good. And it'll be all over the realm. In the mountains, in Ragmarket and Southbridge, in the castle close, too. You'll need help, Cat said. You can't do it all on your own. You should stay here, Han said. It's amazing what you've done in a short time. Jemson was right. You could become a lady's maid or governess. You could teach music. It's your chance to get out of rag market for good. You think I'd rest easy between the sheets in some mansion house knowing you're in a war? Cat said. I want to swear to you again. I want to help you. I couldn't go up against the Bayars on my own. But maybe I could with you. Han studied Cat, debating. Hope crowded into her face. You'd be putting Cat at risk, Dancer argued. She'd be going up against wizards. She'd be defenseless. I ain't defenseless, Cat snapped, producing a blade from some unknown hiding place and waving it at Dancer. He jerked his head back to save his nose. Han rubbed his chin. I need people who'll do what I say, whether it's going to school or doing slide hand on the street or keeping an eye on people that need watching. I won't have time to argue with you. You can't just pick and choose the jobs you like. Cat nodded, her eyes fixed on his face. I promise I'll do what you say. You need to keep up on your schooling, he said. Music, art, language, all that. You need to be able to mix in with blue bloods. If it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. You sound like a blue blood already, Cat muttered. There won't be gang shares, not like before, Han went on. I have some money, but that might dry up depending on which way I jump. And you can't be doing side work if you work for me. You can leave any time, but if you decide to go with somebody else, you need to tell me and split clean. I got it, Cat said. No side work. Least you know what the risks are, Han said, half to himself. I don't feel as bad asking you, because you'd be going into it with open eyes. Hans alone, Dancer said. Don't let her throw her life away. Cat gave Dancer a look to shut him up. Then she slid off the edge of the bed and onto her knees. I, Cat Tyburn, swear to you, Cuffs Alistair, she said. I pledge my loyalty, my blades and weapons to your use, 
and place myself under your protection. I'll do what you say. Your enemies are my enemies. I won't do no side work. I promise to bring all takings to you and to accept my gang share from your hands as you see fit. And she smiled her radiant, dangerous smile. Chapter 32 Shifting Alliances Abelard's crew trickled into the Dean's meeting room, clustering on the other side of the table from Han, eyeing him with mistrust. Micah sighed and rolled his eyes, as if expecting little out of this session, but underneath the boredom, Han could smell a visceral fear. Nobody seemed eager to go anywhere with Han Alistair at this particular time. Except Abelard and Griffin, and maybe Fiona. Her expression of cool appraisal told him that she hadn't given up winning him to her cause. The Demon King amulet hung around Han's neck. Alongside it hung a demon eye talisman carved from rowan and oak. This bit of bagged flash was supposed to protect him from possession. He and Dancer hadn't been able to test it, of course, because, despite Mordra's seminar, neither of them knew how to go about possessing someone. Han's amulet was packed with power. Crow had mentioned stealing power from someone else, but Dancer had uncovered a charm that allowed him to donate power to Han by linking their amulets together. It's all right, Dancer had said, grinning. I didn't have any big magical plans anyway. As soon as Han had entered the room, Micah's eyes fixed on the serpent amulet. He stared at it then looked up and met Han's eyes, probably wondering if Kat had made a try for it yet. Micah had probably hoped Han would have to come before the Dean without it. Now that we're all here, we'll begin, Dean Abelard said. When Alistair joined our study group, I told you that he had been successful in traveling to Edeon. This afternoon, he will share his expertise with us. Hopefully, you have arrived with fully charged amulets. She nodded to Han. The floor is yours. All right, then, Han said. He wasn't sure whether he should get up or stay in his seat. He elected to stand. You probably know that it's not easy getting to Edeon. Some wizards think it doesn't even exist, but it does. The first time I went was in Master Griffin's class, but I've been there several times since. And always came back, it seems. Micah drawled, as if he'd rather he hadn't. Well, that's important, isn't it? Han said, tilting his head back and looking down his nose at Micah. You wouldn't want to get stranded there. That'd be bad. He kept looking at Micah until Micah looked away. Some people think the key to getting to Edeon is the amulet you use, Han went on. Others think that once you get there, it's easier the next time kind of like you're breaking a trail you can use over and over. He looked around the table. How many of you have tried to go to Edeon? Everybody raised a hand. How many of you have succeeded? Be honest now, Abelard put in. The hands went down. How do we know you've been there? Mordra asked, fingering her amulet. Han looked at Abelard, who said, I am convinced of it, and that's all you need to know. Mordra shrugged, and Han continued. Today I'll help you get there using my amulet and the trail I've made, he said. I can't guarantee you'll be able to go back on your own, but it may make it easier for you the next time. This was complete rubbish, a story that he and Crow had worked out together, but Han was a rum liar, and they all nodded, even Griffin, though he looked a little puzzled. Now, we have to be touching, Han said. Let's lie down in a circle. He'd asked Abelard to lay out seven straw mattresses in a circle by the window. They all laid down, with their heads nearly meeting in the middle. Han heard some muttering and snorting as they assumed their positions. He helped Griffin to get down, then lay down on the remaining mattress. Han knew they felt ridiculous, but he didn't want vacated bodies toppling over and crashing to the floor. See, he said, 
just like a seance at the temple school. Nervous laughter rippled around the circle. All right, everyone touching? Han felt the buzz of power from Griffin on one side and Abelar on the other. He guessed they'd wanted to be next to him to make extra sure they wouldn't be left behind. Now, here are some things to remember, Han said, staring up at the ceiling. You probably know all this already, but it bears repeating. You can change your appearance in Edeon, your clothing, your physical characteristics. So try that out. You can create illusions at will. It's the dream world, remember. Magic works, so be careful with it. And don't use up all your stored power experimenting. You'll need it to get back. We're all going to the same place so we can find each other. We'll stay about ten minutes. You'll need my help to return, so we'll all meet and come back together. If anyone's amulet is running low, tell me right away. He paused. Any questions? Where are we going? Griffin asked. Bridge Street, Han said. Is there anyone who hasn't been there? This was met by more nervous laughter. We'll meet under the clock in front of the crown and castle, Han said. Don't stray too far from there. Ten minutes goes by quick in Edeon. Ready? Hands off your amulets. Here's the charm you'll be using. Han told it to them and had them repeat it. It was the same charm Griffin had taught them back in the fall. Han would be using something different, the potent charm that would actually carry them all across. All right. Ready? Han said. Open your portals. Han gripped his amulet and spoke Crow's charm. The break between worlds was longer and deeper this time, long enough to worry about being stuck between. When the darkness finally faded, he stood alone under the clock on Bridge Street. Griffin immediately materialized in front of him, eyes closed, holding tight to his amulet. Griffin. Han said softly. Griffin opened his eyes. He was a griffin made whole, without leg braces and crutches. He looked down at himself, and a pleased smile broke across his face. He took a few tentative steps, then reshaped himself, growing taller, more muscular, better matching his handsome features. Abelard appeared, then Hadron, de Villiers, and the Bayars last. When Micah and Fiona arrived, Griffin's clothing became just a little finer and better fitting. All right, Han said. Everyone's here. Now try changing the scene a bit. Han gestured, and large purple flowers burst from the pavement, waist high. Go easy, though. We don't want to end up in a tangle. The others conjured flowers and fireworks, fields and waterfalls, though Micah didn't really join in the fun. He stood back, hand on his amulet, his eyes fixed on Han as if expecting him to make a move on him. You can also change your clothes if you want, or the clothes of those around you. A battle of dueling apparel erupted as they manipulated each other's attire. Even Abelard joined in. Soon everyone was laughing. From what I know, Han said, what's real in Edeon is wizards, amulets, and magic. Everything else is illusion. We all came from the same room, he went on, but we could be spread all over the seven realms and still come together in a common place, if you planned ahead of time. Otherwise, you'd never find each other. Is bad weather coming in? Mordra said, shivering and peering up at the sky. It sure looks real. A cold wind ripped between the buildings, raising goose flesh on Han's exposed skin. Dark, mottled clouds rolled in, turning midday into a peculiar twilight. Han conjured a deerskin jacket lined with fleece. The others followed suit, donning warmer clothes in the face of the drop in temperature. Did you do that? Griffin asked Han, eyeing the sky. Change the weather, I mean. Han shook his head, at a loss to explain it. Could one of the others have done it? Micah or Fiona? They still clutched their amulets, but they both gazed skyward apprehensively, so it seemed unlikely.
Han had never visited Edeon in a crowd before. It was hard to say who was really in control. Lightning brindled the sky, turning it garish shades of green and purple. A clamor of thunder made everyone cover their ears. That's enough, Alistair, Mordra said, pulling her head in like a turtle. You've made your point. Han gripped his amulet and tried to conjure better weather, but with no success. Illusion or not, the oncoming storm was hard to ignore. Who is that? Dean Abelard asked, shading her eyes and squinting past Han. Han turned, then stood gaping in surprise. It was Crow, dressed more finely than Han had ever seen him. In brilliant cloth of gold that set off his midnight hair, a jewel-encrusted sword in his hand. By now the sky was as black as Darkman's hour, but it didn't matter. Crow lit up the whole street. He strode purposefully toward them, his sword extended, a bone-chilling smile on his face, flame rippling around him like a halo around a saint. Han stepped in between Crow and Abelard's crew. What are you doing here? he demanded. He hadn't said anything to Crow about the time of their visit or the place of their meeting. How had he found them? Alistair, Abelard said, explain this at once. Is this person your creation or someone you know? Crow twitched in irritation. Turning, he flicked his hand, and a mammoth wall of flame erupted from the street, separating Han and the Bayars from the others. With a gesture, he set it rolling, driving the others down the street. Beyond the blaze, Han could hear screaming and shouting. Han swung around to face Crow again. What are you doing? My business is with you and the Bayas, Crow said. We don't need interference from them. He stood before the Bayar twins, growing in size and brilliance until he dwarfed the pair. Ah, he said, gloating. Finally, I've been waiting for this for a long time. What are you talking about? Micah demanded, shading his eyes with his forearm. I don't know you. But I know you. Crow said. I know who and what you are. Lazily, he flicked flame from the tip of his sword. It rocketed toward Micah, and Micah dodged aside. Fiona's eyes shifted from Han to Crow and back again. Why are you doing this? she said. Han shook his head. Go on, he said to Crow. Get out of here. You're not invited. I'm making good on a promise, Crow said. I promised to destroy Airy House. I'm going to start with these two. Alistair, if this is your idea of a joke, I'm not amused, Micah said. I should have known better than to go along with this scheme. Arrogant, true to your breed, Crow said. He sent another gout of flame jetting toward Micah and Fiona. They leaped to either side, rolling as they hit the ground. Fiona answered with a flaming attack of her own, but Crow let it sizzle through him with no apparent ill effects. Micah put up a shimmering wall like solidified light between him and Fiona and Crow and Han. Crow sent flame roaring right through it, and once again, Micah and Fiona dodged out of the way. Crow seemed to be toying with them, every attack a near miss. Han stepped between Crow and the Bayars, skin prickling with anticipation of the flame, knowing he'd likely get fried from front and back. He felt betrayed, played like a loaded mark. Stop this, Alistair, Fiona said, or I will stop you. She took hold of her amulet and extended her hand toward Han. Crow, Han said. Forget it. I'm not going to let you kill them. Why not? Crow demanded. He shifted from side to side, trying to get a clear shot. They tried to kill you several times, and it's not like they'd shed a tear over you. I have a plan, Han said, and this isn't it. Perhaps you want the pleasure of killing them yourself? Crow got off a little bow. Fair enough. Be my guest. He disappeared. 
Han felt a kind of pressure, then a rough mental push, as if his mind were being straight-armed. Then another and another, as if someone were beating on his skull. It was Crow trying to get in and getting bounced. Han fingered the Rowan talisman and breathed a silent thank you to Dancer. Give it up, Han said, just managing to sidestep the balls of flame Fiona lobbed at him. It's not going to work this time. Crow slammed into his mind again, and again and again. Come on, I can't fight three on one like this, Han said. Do you want to get me killed? He screamed as one of Micah's fiery blasts grazed him, setting his clothes aflame. Frantically, Han beat at his clothing, then with a gesture, turned the street under Micah and Fiona into a mud pot. They sank to their waists. Kill them, Alistair, Crow whispered in his ear, or they'll kill you. Kill them yourself, you sponging, goat-swimming huff, Han said, putting up a shield to hold off a series of small tornadoes embedded with shards of glass. I'm not going to fight your battles for you. Why didn't Crow kill them himself? He knew more magic than the three of them combined. Surely he could come up with a death charm the Bayars couldn't counter. His flaming attack seemed to go right through Micah's defenses, but every blow had missed, or been deflected, or somehow not connected. Han, Micah, and Fiona were doing more damage to each other than Crow had done to anyone. A suspicion kindled in Han's mind. Crow changed strategy. As Micah and Fiona struggled their way out of the ooze, Micah staggered backward as if struck, his eyes widening in surprise. He stood stock still for a long moment. Then, gripping his amulet, he turned and extended his hand toward Fiona. Micah? Fiona blinked at him. What are you- Fiona, look out! Han shouted, pushing Fiona to the ground as Micah launched his charm and flame roared over their heads. Micah! Fiona screamed, rolling to her feet. What are you doing? Micah's next shot blistered Fiona's arm before she could leap aside. While Micah focused on burning his sister to a cinder, Han tackled him around the waist, sending them both flying face first into the mud. Run, Fiona! Han shouted, spitting out mud. Get out of here or he'll kill you. I'm not leaving my brother, she screamed at him. You'll kill him. This ain't your brother, Han shouted back. Can't you tell? He's possessed. Han ripped Micah's hands away from his amulet for the third time. Fiona hesitated, her hand on her amulet, hand extended, unable to get a clear shot at Han without striking her brother. Kill me and you'll never get out of here, Han shouted, exasperated. Micah struggled and kicked, doing his best to rid himself of Han so he could hush his sister. But Micah had a lot to learn as a street fighter. Han wasn't sure how to evict Crow without killing Micah, but he had a theory. Keeping a tight grip on Micah, he yanked off Micah's amulet. Crow materialized again as himself, mad as a cat in a downpour. Moments later, his consciousness slammed into Han again and failed again to penetrate. While Han was distracted, Micah smashed his fist into the side of Han's head, making him see stars. Give me back my amulet, you gutter-spawned pretender! Han smacked him with an immobilization charm, and Micah finally went down and lay still, staring up at the sky. It worked so well, Han did the same for Fiona. Now kill them, Alistair, Crow said, standing over the Bayar twins like the Breaker, eager to snatch up some souls. Kill them now. Nuh-uh, Han said, swiping blood from the side of his face. He nodded toward Micah and Fiona. If you want them killed, then you do it. Hurry, Crow said. You're running low on power. You'll have to go back before long. Han broadened his stance, folding his arms in defiance. You can't do magic on your own, can you? You've been using mine all along. Crow flinched, and Han knew he'd guessed right. How can you say I can't do magic? Crow said. 
How could I be here otherwise? How could I do this? And he sent flames spiraling down the street. You can do illusions, Han said. You showed me that the first day. But you can't do magic in the real world. You can't do magic that would kill them, he pointed at the Bayars, without me. I'm not going to honor that with a response, Crow said haughtily. I've forgotten more magic than you'll ever know. You know it, Han said, but you can't perform it. You are out of your mind, Crow said. Are you going to kill the Bayar vermin or not? Micah's eyes shifted from Crow to Han, watching this exchange with interest and not a little alarm. Show me how it's done, Han said, pointing. Crow made one more half-hearted attempt to slide into Han's head. How are you shielding yourself? he demanded. You're the one should be explaining what your game is, Han said, not me. You going to hush them or not? If not, we'll be off. As you said, we've been here too long already. Crow gazed at Han for a long moment, as if trying to look through his skin. I've underestimated you, he said finally, shaking his head. It's a common problem, Han replied, especially with blue bloods. Crow blinked out like a dying ember. Han waited a few moments to see if Crow would reappear, then squatted next to Micah and Fiona. You two listen to me. I'm going to release you. We'll find the others and then go back. You have a dispute with me, it can wait till we're out of here. You spill anything to Abelard, I'll leave you behind. You kill or disable me, none of us gets back, and that's the truth. Do you understand? Han waited, and of course they didn't do or say anything in their immobilized condition, but he knew they weren't idiots, so he gave them the benefit of the doubt and disabled the charm. They levered to their feet, slapped their hands on their amulets, and eyed him like he was a wild beast. Come on. Without looking back, Han strode down the street toward Crow's wall of flame, which had died to nothing in his absence. Alistair! A tall, angular figure walked toward him, carefully stepping over the scorched side of the wall. You'd better have an explanation for this. It was Dean Abelard, her hand wrapped around her amulet. The others trailed behind, all except for Griffin, who rushed ahead to take Fiona's hands and peer anxiously into her face. Are you all right? he said. Fiona nodded wordlessly. Griffin slid an arm around her when she seemed in danger of falling. Alistair, Abelard repeated, her voice flinty. What happened? Han shook his head. I don't know, he said. I wish I did. This never happened before, not any of the times I crossed over. I never saw anyone I didn't plan to meet or bring with me. You're injured, the dean said, looking at each of them in turn, her dark brows drawn together. That cove tried to kill us, Han said, just laid into us like a mad tom, sending flames flying and spouting one charm after another. We held him off, but it was touch and go, even three on one. He shuddered. Then finally he just blinked out, disappeared. He must have run out of power. Abelard frowned. You don't know this man. You never saw him before in the real world either? I never did, Han said. He shot Micah and Fiona a warning look. You ever? They just shook their heads, eyes wide, their faces pale as plaster. We didn't know where you were or if you were, if you were still alive, Hadron said, looking up at the Bridge Street clock. It's been a lot more than ten minutes, thirty at least. Proficients de Villiers and Hadron attempted to go back on their own when we knew it was past time for us to return, Abelard said. They were unsuccessful. They were all white-lipped and scared to death, except for Griffin and Abelard. The dean's face was creased with puzzlement and suspicion. Griffin looked happier than Han had ever seen him, the layers of pain and frustration and bitterness fallen away. He looked like a dedicate who'd seen the face of the maker. Peculiar. 
I'd love to chat further about this, Han said, tearing his eyes away from Griffin, but we've been here too long, and I don't want to risk another ambush. Let's go, Mordra said, gazing around uneasily. Everyone reach in and take hold of me. The other six stood in a circle around Han, jockeying for position until they all had a grip. Now, you'll speak the charm to open the portal while I speak mine. The world went dark in a jumble of competing voices. Han opened his eyes to Abelard's meeting room and felt the weight of someone on top of him. It was Fiona. They were in a kind of tangle on the mattresses. Han quickly extracted himself and stood. He counted. All had returned. He let go a sigh of relief. Abelard took her own head count. Well, she said briskly, at least we didn't lose anyone, even if there were a few injuries. Her tone suggested there was no making omelets without breaking eggs. Congratulations on traveling to Edion, something not many can say they've done. I will let you know whether there will be any follow-up on this. In the meantime, I shouldn't have to remind you to say nothing about this to anyone. Excuse me, Dean Abelard, Han said. You all can do what you want. But I'm not going back. It's not worth the risk. Several of the others nodded in agreement. Abelard tightened her lips but said nothing more, as they filed out silently. Micah and Fiona waited for Han at the bottom of the stairs. I want to talk to you, Fiona said, gripping his arm, her fingers digging into his flesh. Hands off, Han said, his knife pressing into Fiona's throat. I'll give you to the count of three. One. She jerked back her hands. Han's knife disappeared. Just because I didn't hush you in Edeon doesn't mean we can all be friends, Han said. I want to get a few things straight with you. Now, let's walk out onto the quad where it's nice and public. I'm not meeting in back alleys with a pair of connivers like you. He walked out into the center of the quad and sat down on a bench on the pavilion surrounding Bayar Fountain. The Bayars followed him. Han gestured to a nearby bench. They sat. What were you thinking, Micah, sending a street rusher up against a wizard? Han said, idly tossing his knife and catching it. That was a mismatch. She's talented, I'll admit. There aren't many temple students who can cut your heart out through your clothes, but she's never been a steady hand as a draw latch. I don't know what you're talking about, Micah said at the same time that Fiona said, Who? Cat Tyburn doesn't crew for you anymore, Han said. Sorry. Who is Cat Tyburn? Fiona asked, looking from Han to Micah with narrowed eyes. Micah eyed him, his curiosity clearly battling with his desire to keep denying what Han already knew. What happened? Where is she? He said finally. Where do you think? Han flipped his knife, caught it. You killed her? Micah's expression was all horrified fascination. Han shrugged. I don't want to talk about Cat. Well, I do, Fiona snapped glaring at her brother. What have you been up to? Later, Micah said. Let's talk about what happened in Edeon. Who is Crow? Or was he just a bit of conjury you put on for our benefit? Han tried the edge of his blade against his thumb. To tell you the truth, I have no idea who Crow is, or what his game is. I was as surprised as you when he showed up. But you know him, Fiona pressed, that was obvious. I've met him, Han said, putting his knife away. Can't say I know him. Let's just say that your visit to Edeon was a case of getting in over your head. Magically, I mean. He closed his hand on the Demon King's amulet. Now, we need to get something settled. I've had enough of always watching my back, waiting for somebody to pick my pocket or jinx me, or slide a blade between my ribs. He waggled the amulet. You want this? Come and get it. Micah shook his head. We're not stupid. You'll attack us. 
or we'll get expelled for attacking you. I promise, cross my heart, I won't attack you. If you can take it, you can have it. Han smiled, all toothy and slantwise. Either one. Come on, who's first? Toss it over here, Fiona said. Now that would be stupid, wouldn't it? Han said. You with three amulets between the two of you, me without any. He held the amulet up by its chain. Nah. You come take it from me. Micah shook his head again. No, I don't trust you. Han sighed. Guess you're way too smart for me. See, this thing is choosy about who uses it. Touch it, and you're nothing more than a smudge of ash and a lingering stench on the breeze. You're forgetting that I've used it before, Micah said. Then come get it, Han said, grinning, caressing the serpent's head. Now or never. Fiona pursed her lips. You're saying you can handle it and we can't, when we're the rightful owners? You Bayars keep saying this jinx piece belongs to you. Han said. It doesn't. You stole it from Alger Waterloo a thousand years ago. It was supposed to be destroyed, but your family's got a whole stash of illegal magical weapons, don't you? The two Bayars sat perfectly still, not blinking, their hands cradling their own, probably stolen, jinx pieces. You can't prove any of that, Fiona said finally. Sure I can. All I have to do is hand this amulet over to the clans and tell them where I got it. They'll believe me. I'd say my word with them is better than yours. Besides, Hayden Firedancer was there that day on Hanalea, and he's well connected with the spirit clans. You won't hand it over, Micah said. The clans will destroy it. Maybe, Han said. Maybe not. But I promise you this. You won't get it back. Your father murdered my mother and my sister. The Queen's Guard locked them in a stable and set it on fire. They burned to death. Lord Bayard didn't light the fire, but he might as well have. My sister was seven years old. Micah's gaze shifted away. You were wanted for murder. The Queen... Han raised his hand to stop the spray of words. Murders I didn't commit. Oh, there's plenty of blame to go around. The Queen's on the list, too. But I'm not stupid. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that. Fiona shook her head, eyes fixed on Han's face. No, I won't. After that, somebody, your people or the Queen's, somebody murdered my friends in Ragmarket, trying to get them to tell where I was. Some of them were litlings, too. They didn't pick the street life, you know. It was that or starve. Han tilted his head. You going to tell me the queen was hunting me because of some Southies that died? You stabbed our father when he tried to negotiate the return of the amulet, Fiona said. You nearly killed the high wizard of the realm. I would say that's reason enough for the guard to go looking for you. Negotiate? Han stared at her. Negotiate? You blue bloods got your own patter flash. On the street, we call it having tea with the pigs. He told me straight out he was going to take me back to your place and torture me to death. Micah shifted impatiently. So what's your point? The point is, I paid a really high price for this amulet, Han said. There's no way either of you can use it, and I'd rather it was melted down and destroyed than back in your hands. Do you believe me? I believe you, Fiona whispered, her face even paler than usual. But you're a fool if you continue to use it. You don't know how dangerous it is. I'll take my chances, Han said. You know, Micah, that first night, when I saw you on Bridge Street, I wanted to kill you. I wanted to cut your throat and watch your blood soak into the dirt. I wanted to wrap a strangle cord around your neck and throttle you while you kicked and messed yourself. I'm shaking in my boots, Micah said looking Han dead in the eyes. Han stood and took a step toward him. I'm what's hiding in the side street when you walk home from the four horses, he said. I'm the shadow in Greystoke Alley when you go out to take a piss. I'm the footpad in the corridor when you visit the girly at Grievous Hall. 
Micah's eyes narrowed, his self-assurance wilting a bit. Han could tell he was going back over a hundred suspicious sights and sounds. You've been following me. I can come and go from your room any time I want, Han said. I can tell you what you say when you talk in your sleep. I know what your down-low girly whispers in your ear. He laughed. You can't keep me out of any place I want to be in. I would have known about Kat sooner, but you always met with her when I was in class. Micah licked his lips. Perhaps you take some kind of perverse pleasure in stalking me, but what I'm saying is, if I wanted you to be dead, you would already be dead a dozen ways. I let you live because now I got a different plan. You Bayars need to learn that you can't have everything you want. I'm going to teach you. This is just the beginning. Micah's eyes narrowed. Is that a threat? Absolutely. Han smiled. Anytime you start a fight, you'd better know who you're coming up against. He stood. Be seeing you. Chapter 33 Matrimony or Murder It was a gray and gloomy Thursday, though warmer and more humid than any April day had a right to be. Raisa was done with classes for the day, but she didn't want to go back to Grindle Hall and watch Eamon watch her. He'd been edgy for days, even before the episode with Han. What is the matter with you? She'd demanded the night before in the practice yard. I've never seen you so jumpy. I have a feeling you're in danger, he said. I can't shake it. Is this about Han Alistair? She'd asked pausing with her staff across her body. He shook his head. No, not entirely anyway. I've felt like this since Hallie came home, like something bad is about to happen. He adjusted his grip on his staff, carefully placing his hands. I've learned not to ignore those instincts. Please be careful, Ray. She'd debated whether to show Queen Mariana's letter to Eamon and had decided against it. Could Eamon's worries have anything to do with that? Could he sense how unsettled she was, how tempted she was to travel back home? In the midst of all this, Raisa had exams to study for and a decision to make about what to wear to the cadet's ball. Female cadets had the option of wearing either their dress uniform or a gown. The uniform would be easier, but Raisa was afraid she'd be taken for somebody's boyish young squire who'd been allowed to stay up late. Sometimes she actually missed dressing up. Still, it was probably too late to hire a seamstress, and unlikely she'd find something to fit her in the second-hand shops along Bridge Street. Tonight she'd meet with Han. Her heart accelerated. She'd sent a message to Hampton Hall. Han, I apologize that our evening ended so abruptly. It was wonderful up until then. A.B. apologizes also. Well... That's not strictly true, but I apologize for him. Looking forward to Thursday and to the dance. Rebecca. There'd been no reply. Maybe I should see if he shows for tutoring tonight before I look for a dress, Raisa thought glumly. She was tempted to cross the bridge and find Han at his dormitory, but that could end badly in a number of ways. Eamon's edginess was catching. Raisa found herself constantly looking over her shoulder, feeling the itch on the back of her neck that said someone was watching her. Gray wolves clustered on the quad, their ears pressed back against their heads, and she heard their plaintive howls late at night. Finally, she hid out in an upstairs reading room at the Wienhaus Library and tried to study. But Han Alistair kept intruding into her thoughts, and Eamon Byrne. And Mariana, her mother. One moment she decided to return home to the Fells as soon as exams were over. The next she worried that her return might precipitate a crisis. She read the same paragraph over and over until she fell asleep, her face pillowed on her arms. Newling Morley! Raisa looked up to see a nervous-looking cadet standing in the doorway. She blinked at him hazily. Oh, I must have fallen asleep. What time is it? 
It's after nine o'clock, he said. The library's closed. He scanned the room as if to make sure, then added, Everyone else is gone. Then it struck her. Nine o'clock. She was supposed to meet Han at eight, on Bridge Street. Madly, she scraped her papers and books together, stuffing them into her carry bag. Would he have waited? Would he have come at all? The click of the door latch made her look up. The cadet had stepped inside and shut and locked the door. On second glance, he didn't look so cadet-like. Maybe it was his ill-fitting uniform and the fact that he was older than most of Race's classmates. Perhaps it was his flat black eyes and the way his nervousness dropped away like a cloak he wore against the weather. Maybe it was the way he moved toward her, like a predator. Thank you for waking me, Corporal, Raisa said, her heart thudding under her jacket. What's your name? My name's Rivers, he said. Corporal Rivers. He circled around the table toward her, seeming unaware of the fact that he was wearing a cadet scarf, not a corporal's. Wolves slunk along the walls, whining uneasily. When Rivers got within range, Raisa snatched up her jar of blotting sand and flung it into his face. He was quick. He nearly managed to dodge out of the way, but some of it went into his eyes. He scrubbed at them with the heels of his hands, and that's when she saw the garret dangling from one fist. Grabbing up the study lamp from the desk, Raisa smashed it into the side of his head and ran for the door. Somehow, he was on top of her before she could get it open. Grabbing a fistful of her hair, he yanked her head back, looping the strangle cord around her neck. As he pulled back to tighten it, Raisa slid her hand between the garret and her windpipe, another trick from Eamon Byrne, braced her feet against the door and launched herself backward, smashing her head into the assassin's chin with an audible crack. The assassin's head struck the edge of the table and they both went down on their backs, Raisa on top. Raisa ripped away the strangle cord, rolling to her feet and groping for her dagger. But Rivers lay still, his head at an impossible angle. Raisa turned and fumbled at the latch, her hands shaking so hard she could scarcely manage it. Finally, she yanked the door open and ran straight into Micah Bayar. He closed his arms tight around her, pinning her arms to her sides. Lifting her, he carried her back into the room, turning her so she was pressed up against him, her back to his front. She fought for her life, screaming and kicking and squirming and flinging out her elbows, employing all the street-fighting skills Eamon had taught her. Micah held her in such a way that it was difficult to gain leverage enough to do any real damage. She smashed her heel into his kneecap, and his breath hissed out in pain, but he didn't loosen his hold. Instead, he smacked her knife hand against the wall until she dropped the blade. He kicked it away, and it pinged as it hit the wall. She tried to memorize its location in case she had the chance to get it back. Power trickled into her, a current that ran down her arm and into Elena's talisman ring, a fraction of Micah's usual output. Is that the best you can do? Raisa said, still struggling to free her arms. Magically impotent today, are we? Unexpectedly, Micah laughed. I am a bit drained at the moment, I will admit, he said. I've missed you, he murmured, pressing her close, his lips against her hair. Truly, and to think you were right here all along. What a wasted opportunity for clandestine trysts away from that wretched nurse of yours. I haven't missed you, she retorted. Go away and I'll let you know when I do, if I don't cut my throat instead. We need to talk, Micah said. I could stand here holding you, which I'm thoroughly enjoying, but it is difficult to talk to the back of your head. I would prefer to look at your face. If I let go of you, can we have a civil conversation without my risking the fate of the unfortunate on the floor? Well, if they were going to talk, Raisa wanted to be able to read Micah's face, too, and try to discern what lay behind the words. All right, she said. I promise to hear you out. Micah loosened his hold and took a step back. 
When she turned to face him, he looked her up and down, taking in her soldier's tunic, her shaggy cap of hair, the Wienhaus emblem embroidered on the front. You are transformed, your highness, he said. Are you really at Wienhaus? I'm in a special program for royalty in exile, Raisa said. For princesses who refuse to marry at sword point, we're learning to fight off unwanted suitors. There were no swords in evidence, as I recall, Micah said. He paused for a heartbeat. My father was most displeased with me when I let you slip away on what was to be our wedding night. I wish you could have been there to share it. Your father's displeasure or our wedding night, Raisa said. Micah laughed again. Both. It has been a less interesting world without you. Micah looked different from the last time she'd seen him. His hair was shorter, cropped into a student cut. His face seemed thinner, as if he'd lost weight, though it was hard to tell under the cloak. But he was as breathtakingly handsome as ever, his dark eyes shaded by his black brows, shadows layering the fine bone structure of his face. He also looked scuffed up and bruised, as if he'd recently been in a fight. Micah glanced down at the man on the floor. Brava, your highness, he said. He's really very good. He drew off his leather gloves and slapped them thoughtfully against his palm. He was trying to radiate confidence, but his hands shook a little. Well, he can't be that good, Raisa said, trying to sound offhand, trying to control her own shakes. On the contrary, he is. He just underestimated you. We all did. We've been looking for you for months. I should have known you'd be down here with Corporal Byrne, and that your copperhead father was in on the conspiracy. I don't know what you're talking about, Raisa said. Damn, 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 she thought. The Bayars would welcome an opportunity to be rid of the Burns and Lord Averill, to remove those voices from the Queen's ear. We thought it peculiar when a cadet from Odin's Ford visited Lord Demoni, and Demoni went to the Queen, Micah said. So when the girl left, we thought it worthwhile to have her followed. She came straight back here, to Grindel Hall. With a focus that narrow, it didn't take long to pick you out. And so you sent an assassin after me, Raisa said. Four, actually, Micah said. The other three were waiting downstairs while Rivers came in to find you. They were puzzled that you didn't come out when the library closed. Why kill me? Raisa asked. Figuring she might as well know before she died. Was it because I jilted you at the altar, or? Well, Micah said. We Bayars are very sensitive about being jilted after that episode with Queen Hanalea. But my father also worries about your rebellious nature and your close connection to the clans. You even look like a mixed blood. I am a mixed blood, Raisa said, lifting her chin. Melanie is also, but she doesn't look like a copperhead. She looks like her mother. So my father has set his sights on her. He would like to see a more malleable queen on the throne. He's been unsuccessful in persuading the queen to disinherit you and needs to get you out of the way so his plans to marry me to Melanie can proceed. Micah said all of this matter-of-factly, his black eyes fixed on her face. Raisa stared at Micah, her stomach clenching into a miserable ball. It was a good thing she'd missed supper because she would have lost it right then. She felt impotent, utterly frustrated, and frightened. As the Montans had amply proven, nobody was more at risk than someone who competes for a throne and loses. The Bayars would cut her throat or strangle her and leave her in some back alley, the apparent victim of a street thief. Too bad rebellious Raisa had left the protection of Felsmarch and got herself killed. Melanie is thirteen, Raisa said. I hope you have experience babysitting, Micah, because you're going to need it. Assuming the demon I don't assassinate you first. Married at thirteen, widowed at fourteen. Poor Melanie. Angry tears stung her eyes. Even if you survive, 
You'll be ruling over a country torn apart by civil war. The Fells will become the Arden of the North. You'll never win against the clans in the mountains. I'll tell you that right now. She extended her hand toward Micah and spat out a curse worthy of any of her clan ancestors. By Hannah Leah's blood and bones, if you marry Melanie Anna Mariana and mount the Grey Wolf throne, may you be fighting for the rest of your short and miserable life, and may Melanie's babies be copperheads, every one. Micah blinked at her, stunned to silence. His gaze dropped to her extended hand, and his eyes widened. Seizing hold of her hand, he dragged her into the pool of light spilling from the sconce on the wall. He nudged Elena's wolf ring with his forefinger, turning her hand so it caught the light. Where did you get this? he asked. Raisa shrugged, pretending indifference, though her heart was pounding. I think it was a suitor gift for my name day. It looks like clan work, he said, frowning. Most of my jewelry is clan-made, Raisa said, trying unsuccessfully to pull her hand free. That's no surprise. They are the best metalsmiths in the Seven Realms. Micah tugged at the wolf ring experimentally, then with more force. It didn't budge. Take it off, he said, thrusting her hand back toward her. Have you turned robber as well as murderer? Raisa asked. The Bayars aren't rich enough as it is. That ring looks like a talisman, Micah said. It might account for your resistance to wizardry. It's just a ring, Raisa said, tugging at it herself. Even if she'd been trying hard, which she wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. And it seems to be stuck, so unless you want to chop my finger off, you'll have to let it be. All right, Micah said, raising both hands. We'll let it be. For now. Why are you here, anyway? Raisa asked. Did you want to dip your hands in my blood and curse me for the crime of refusing to marry you? Did you want to see if your assassin did the job right, or join in? Micah nudged the dead man on the floor with his foot. To be precise, he's my father's assassin, he said. Not mine. Raisa stared at him speechless. I came to offer you a choice, Micah said, turning the ring on his own finger. I can take you downstairs and deliver you to the assassins waiting outside, he said, or you can return to the fells and marry me. Raisa collapsed into an armchair. What? Micah smiled thinly. I think you are exactly right. The copperheads will have no doubt who is responsible for your murder, even if you are dead, naming Melanie Princess Heir and marrying her to me will cause a firestorm of protest. The clans will rise in rebellion. It would cast a pall over our reign and any children we would have. Our reign, Raisa thought. Our children? Micah and Melanie? The notion made Raisa's skin crawl. You are close to the Copperheads, Micah went on. You fostered with them, and you carry their blood. My father sees that as a negative. I see it as an advantage. You're the blooded heir, and you're persuasive. If you came out in favor of our marriage, it might go a long way toward convincing the clans to go along with it. No, Raisa thought. They'll never accept a wizard consort, let alone a king. Never, ever. But... Given the circumstances, she saw no reason to say it aloud. Micah kept his eyes fixed on Raisa, as if trying to read through her skin. The whole matter of the wedding was badly handled. I begged my father for time to convince you to marry me willingly. He was in a hurry. He never saw your consent as being important. He doesn't know you the way I do. No doubt Micah was recalling their back-corridor romance in the months leading up to her name day. No doubt he'd been counting on his considerable charm to prevail. We could be good together, he'd said. You don't know me as well as you think you do, Raisa thought. The queendom always comes first, before matters of the heart.
Raisa licked her lips and chose her words carefully while her mind raced. Well, I must admit I felt betrayed. The queen had never mentioned a match between us before that night. I hadn't planned to marry so young. I couldn't understand why I was expected to marry on my name day. Why are you doing this, Micah? Raisa thought. Why aren't you just letting matters proceed as planned? Crossing your father is as dangerous as crossing the clans. Why take this kind of risk? This goes beyond politics, she thought. Micah wants to marry me, not Melanie. That was amazing. Melanie was the beauty of the family. Blonde, tall, and willowy, she mirrored their mother. Race's younger sister was a child now, but she wouldn't always be. In the meantime, Micah would no doubt continue his back corridor prowling. If Micah married Melanie, he couldn't leave Raisa alive. Even if he had no stomach for her murder, there would be no way he'd want to leave a living, breathing competitor for the Grey Wolf throne, someone an opposition could rally around. One thing Raisa knew, she was no Queen Regina ready to throw herself off a cliff to avoid marrying a wizard. She'd return to the fells and marry a butcher or a rag picker or a cleaner of privies if that's what it took to stay alive and hang on to the Grey Wolf throne. If she could stay alive, she'd find a way to win. Death or marriage, Raisa said, rolling her eyes. You Bayars really know how to charm a girl. Micah shrugged. Not the proposal I would have preferred, but it's not up to me. Do you think your father will accept this? Raisa asked. Or will he simply wait for a new opportunity to murder me? Micah's face went hard, his lips whitening. My father knows as well as I do that a marriage between us is the politically savvy thing to do. He will accept it. Are you trying to convince me or yourself? Raisa thought. All right, she said. You win. I will marry you if it assures that the succession remains unchanged. Micah stood looking at her for a long moment, as if to uncover the girl behind the mask. Perhaps, Micah said finally, with a crooked smile, we should seal our bargain with a kiss. He put his hands on her shoulders and drew her in, sliding his arms around her and bending his neck to press his lips to hers. This is a test, Raisa thought, and she did her best to pass it. Micah put a lot into the kiss as well. It left her flushed and breathless, and Micah looking reassured. We'll leave in a few hours then, Micah said. I need to pack my belongings and notify the stableman. Do you still ride that piebald mare? Raisa nodded, hope kindling. Was it possible that Micah was so confident he would allow her to go collect her things? I'll fetch your horse, he said, as if he'd read her thoughts. The clothes on your back will have to do. You can borrow anything else you need from Fiona. We'll travel light and fast. As if Fiona's clothes would fit me, she thought. Micah fished under his cloak and brought out a small stoppered bottle filled with a purple liquid. A tiny copper cup was attached with a chain. He swirled the bottle to mix the contents, then pulled the stopper and poured. Here, he said, handing the little cup to Raisa. Drink up. She sniffed the brew unhappily. It had a sharp, sweet scent, like dessert wine. What is this? Something to keep you quiet until we leave, since my wizardly charms no longer seem to work on you. When she scowled at him, he shrugged. I'm not so foolish as to trust you, Raisa. Why should I trust you? I don't know what's in that. Maybe you mean to poison me yourself. Micah rolled his eyes. You're not really in a position to dictate terms, he said. What about the assassins downstairs? she asked. If this knocks me out, you'll have your hands full and I'll be helpless. I'll handle them. Micah said. Now drink it before they come up looking for us. Seeing no way around it, Raisa drank the purple potion. It tasted like dessert wine, too, with a bit of a bitter aftertaste. 
Turtleweed? She guessed. Micah nodded. Sorry, it does cause that nasty headache after. Do you always carry turtleweed around with you? He shook his head. I haven't really needed it up till now. Turtleweed was fast acting, and Rasa was a small person. It wasn't long before her head began to swim. Wolves crowded in around her as if trying to prop her up. She dug her fingers into their thick coats, trying to cling to consciousness. Was Han waiting for her? Would he have gone to find her at the dorm? No one knew where she was. Would Eamon be able to tell where she'd gone and come after her? Don't get any ideas while I'm asleep, they are, she mumbled. He sighed. I can't control what ideas I have, he said. But don't worry, we'll have a lifetime to carry them out. He slid his arms under her, lifting her, covering her with his cloak. She felt woozy, loose-limbed, and floppy, and waves of sleepiness rolled over her. Micah's heart thudded under her ear as they descended the stairs and pushed through the front doors. Raisa tried to lift her head and look around, but couldn't seem to find the strength. Where are they? The assassins. They're already dead, Micah whispered in her ear. I killed them on my way up, else I would have been there sooner. Chapter 34 Shoulder Taps Han waited at the Turtle and Fish an hour past their usual meeting time. Maybe she's having trouble getting away, he thought. Maybe Corporal Byrne is keeping her to quarters. Or maybe Rebecca and her Corporal had kissed and made up, and Han was on the outs again. Han wasn't a fool, but he would have said the kisses he and Rebecca shared had been honest, and Rebecca didn't seem like the type to ditch him without an explanation. And what about the cadet's ball? Should he assume it was on until he heard otherwise? Finally, he left a note on the table and clumped back down the stairs. Link looked up sympathetically. Trouble? Han shrugged. I don't know. He thought about walking over to Grindle, but didn't want to cause more trouble for Rebecca, or show up where he wasn't wanted. So he walked back to Hampton, nodding to Blevins in the common room and mounting the stairs. He hoped Dancer was home. He'd stayed out all night the night before, which wasn't unusual. Sometimes he slept at Firesmith's Forge when he was trying to finish a project. Han hadn't even told him what had happened in Edeon. When Han arrived on the fourth floor, precious stones and metal findings littered the tabletop and the cup of tea next to them was still warm, but Dancer was nowhere in sight. Clearly, he'd been there, working, not long ago. In fact, there were two cups. Dancer's door was closed. Hey, Dancer? Han tried his door, and it was latched from the inside. Don't come in, Dancer said. Han heard shuffling and rustling on the other side of the door. Well, I can't very well, since it's latched. Han said. Are you in bed this early? He heard muffled whispering inside and yanked his hand back from the door. Sorry, he said, backing away. Uh, sorry. He hadn't even known Dancer was walking out with anyone, but then he pretty much kept such matters to himself. Han sat down at his work desk and half-heartedly leafed through his fog. He supposed he could study on his own, but it wouldn't be the same. He put the book aside and pulled out his notes from Griffin's class. He had an exam the next day, but his thoughts kept turning to Rebecca. After a few minutes, Dancer's door opened and he poked his head out. I thought this was your tutoring night, he said. You're back early. Rebecca didn't show, Han said, shrugging. Maybe because of that incident at her dormitory on Tuesday with Commander Byrne. Dancer leaned on the doorframe. Hmm. You going to introduce me? Han said, nodding toward the doorway. Dancer looked over his shoulder into his room. Do you want to be introduced? He asked. A moment later, the girlie poked her head out. It was Cat. Oh, Han said. So, 
when were you going to tell me? It's pretty new, Dancer said. We wanted to wait and see if it was working out. Hans struggled to keep from grinning. And? You shut up, Cuffs Alistair, Kat said. She stalked past him, nose in the air, fluffing out her curls. Hey now, I want to know, Han persisted. I mean, last I heard, you hated him. And being as you're both friends of mine, seems like... If you must know, it's fine, Kat said, flopping into a chair, stretching out her legs and curling her bare toes. Tilting her head back, she looked over at Dancer through slitted eyes. He'll do. Glad to hear that's settled, Han said. Dancer was right. Han did need to pay more attention to his friends. What happened with Abelard and the Bayars? Dancer asked. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I had the chance to try out the Rowan talisman yesterday, Han said, poking at an enameled bird with his forefinger. Dancer tilted his head. And? Han told him about what happened in Edeon. So you don't think Crow has any power of his own? Dancer said. Han shook his head. He just parasites off me, or any other charm caster in range. He told me he knew how to drain magic from others. I should have known. Dancer drew his brows together. What is he, then? How did he get there? Well, he's not just a ghosty out of my imagination, because he scared the devil out of everyone else. Han chewed his lower lip. I wonder if there'd be anything helpful in the Bayar library. I say leave it alone, Dancer said, sitting back down at his work table. Tell me you're never going back there. I'm never going back there, Han said. Choosing a bar of silver, Dancer squeezed it in his fist until liquid silver ran out of his hand and into a mold. Better not let Blevins catch you doing that up here. Han said. If there's not a rule against it, he'll make one up. You say that now, but wait until you see what I made for you. Dancer unfolded a square of chamois. Inside was a cunning replica of the lone hunter amulet Elena Sinestra had made for Han, the one he'd loaned to Dancer. Dancer laid the two amulets side by side on the chamois. They were almost impossible to tell apart. That's amazing, Han said. I had no idea you could do work like this, or that you had the right materials. It doesn't work that well, Dancer said, shrugging away the praise. I'm good at the stone cutting and metal smithing, but I haven't mastered the flash part. I wanted to return your amulet, but I guess I need to keep it a while longer. No rush. Keep it. Han ran his finger over the replica jinx piece. It flared up a little, but nothing like the original. But it would likely fool any wizard who didn't touch it. Why didn't you make a fire dancer? Han asked, like the one you lost. Dancer shrugged. I didn't have it to copy. I thought maybe the design fueled the function. I'm hoping to get some answers from Master Firesmith this summer. Han and Dancer both planned to spend the summer working with faculty mentors. Dancer with Firesmith and Han with Abelard. He'd also planned to increase his time with Crow. Not anymore. You do beautiful work, Dancer, Han said. He weighed the intricate carving on his palm, turning it to catch the light. Magic aside, the workmanship and materials made it valuable. He went to give it back, and Dancer shook his head. Keep it, he said. I made it for you. I thought there might be times you'd want to hide the Waterloo amulet. The next morning, Han awoke to the slow stomp, stomp, stomp that meant Blevins was toiling up the stairs to the fourth floor. Han rolled off his bed and yanked on his britches. Cat had stayed over with Dancer, and Han wanted to make sure there were no telltale signs in their makeshift common room. He dropped a cloth over Dancer's metalsmithing tools, just as Blevins's head appeared above the threshold. Don't know why they put fourth floors on buildings. Indeed I don't, he gasped. They should build more buildings, if you ask me, which nobody does. Is there something you need? 
Han asked, as Dancer joined them, closing his door behind him. You're not using an open flame up here, are you? Blevins demanded, eyeing Dancer's work table. That's not allowed. No flames, Dancer said. Hm. Blevins eyed him balefully. Well, there's someone here to see you, Alistair. Won't give a name. A copperhead. He slid a look at Dancer, like he might be to blame. Dancer and Han looked at each other. Not many clan found their way to Odin's ford. Well, why don't you send him up? Han asked. It's a girly is why, Blevins said. Scary looking, if you ask me. But nobody does, Dancer said. And she asked for me by name? Han said. She called you by a different name at first, then switched to Alistair when I said there wasn't no hunts alone here. You need to meet up with her down in the common room, Blevins leaned closer. I'd watch yourself if I was you. If you've done her wrong, I'd go out the back door and keep running. I've heard that if you cross one of them, they'll cut off your... I'll watch myself, Han said. Thank you. I'll come with you, Dancer said. They pushed past Blevins and clattered downstairs, leaving the doormaster to toil along behind them. Han was a little ahead of Dancer on the stairs, so he saw her first. He froze midway down the last staircase, gripping the banister for support, looking down into the common room. It was Bird. Chapter 35 Old Friends Bird stalked restlessly around the common room, hands clasped behind her back. She sorted through the books on the table and peered up at the paintings on the walls, mostly aged banners of wizard houses and portraits of mistwork masters from years past. Han could tell from the way she carried herself that she was nervous, but trying not to show it. Dancer came up behind Han, looking over his shoulder. Bird? he whispered. She turned and saw them. Her copper skin was bronzed a bit more by the sun, and her curls were cropped shorter than Han remembered. She was clad in demon eye traveling garb, deerskin leggings and tunic, and soft, well-worn boots, her bow and quiver of arrows slung over her shoulder. She was leaner and more muscular than before. Han's gaze was drawn to the glittering demon eye amulet around her neck. Hello, digging bird, Han said. This is a surprise. He made no move to descend the rest of the way. He liked having the high ground. Bird inclined her head stiffly. Hans alone, she said, and fire dancer. My name is Nightbird now. Her demon eye name. Had she chosen it to match Reed Nightwalker? Han wondered, with a twinge of jealousy. Or had Reed chosen it for her? Cousin, Dancer said, brushing past Han. It's good to see you. Please share our fire and all that we have. The ritual greeting to the visitor. Walking toward Bird, Dancer opened his arms, smiling. She looked torn between rushing forward and hanging back. It's all right, Dancer said. The amulet drinks it in. You won't even feel it. They embraced. Bird rested her head on Dancer's shoulder, closing her eyes. Well, guess Dancer's forgiven her for the way she treated him, Han thought. And if I'm waiting for an apology, I'll likely wait forever. You've had hard traveling to get here, cousin, Dancer said. I'll put the kettle on for mountain tea. Are you hungry? Have you had breakfast? This rush of words, so uncharacteristic of Dancer, said that he was nervous, too. I would like tea, Bird said, her eyes flicking to Han, still on the stairs. Dancer pumped water from the cistern and filled the kettle, setting it on the hearth to heat and spooning tea into the ceramic pot. The flurry of hospitality suggested that Dancer knew that Han wouldn't step in as host. There's cheese in the pantry and some biscuits I brought back from the dining hall, if you're hungry from the road, Dancer said. He gestured to a grouping of chairs by the hearth. Here, come sit by the fire. 
bird made no move to sit, but stood shifting her weight from foot to foot. I need to speak with Hans alone in private. Han wasn't sure he wanted to visit one-on-one -on -one with Bird. Dancer can hear whatever it is you came to say, he said. I don't mind. He knew he sounded petulant, but he felt wounded and wanted to wound her back. Bird looked from Han to Dancer. No, she said. He can't. Hey now, Han said. You've only just come, and Dancer is glad to see you. He put the emphasis on Dancer. It's all right, Dancer said. I'll visit with Bird later. I was assembling a complicated piece anyway. I'll get back to it. Dancer loped up the stairs, ignoring Han's pointed look. So, Han said when Dancer had gone, we're alone. He didn't know what to think, what to hope for. Bird folded her arms across her chest, gripping her elbows to either side, a familiar gesture. I'm not going to shout. Are you coming down, or should I come up there? Feeling a little foolish, Han walked down the stairs and crossed to the hearth, where the kettle was already steaming. Using a rag, he lifted the kettle and poured water over the leaves. Sit down, he said, waving her to a chair by the fire. She finally sat, and he sat also, resting his hands on the arms of his chair. Han felt the loss of her friendship like a huge, aching hollow in his middle. He and Dancer and Bird had been inseparable every summer of his childhood. This past summer, his relationship with Bird had evolved into something more. Memories churned forward, despite his efforts to tamp them down. Slow kisses and the warmth of her summertime skin, her drowsy voice as they lay on the riverbank, He'd thought he'd seen his future in her eyes. Now there were secrets between them, mistrust and betrayal creating a chasm so wide he doubted it could ever be bridged. She was a demon eye warrior, committed to a thousand-year-old fight against wizards. She'd chosen that vocation despite the fact that Han was a wizard. She'd chosen it instead of him. So you're a full-fledged demon eye warrior now, he said, fingering the worn damask on the arm of the chair. She nodded. Since November. Silence grew between them again, until she said, You're looking well. Are you taller than before? He shrugged. Maybe. Once, they'd measured their heights against each other. It seems like being a warrior agrees with you. Oh, it does, Bird said, her eyes lighting with enthusiasm. I thought I knew about tracking and traveling light on the land, but I've learned so much about weaponry and battle strategy. Nightwalker is a wonderful teacher, so patient and... Her voice trailed off when she focused on Han's face. He tried to reorganize whatever it displayed into an expression of polite interest to cover up his thoughts, which were, they call him Nightwalker because he visits all his girlfriends whenever he's in camp. Bird changed topics. So, have you been? You are taking classes in jinx? In wizardry, then? Han nodded. We just took our end of terms, our examinations. That's one year down out of three or four. Have you learned very much, or is it mostly preliminary? Bird asked. There was something in her face that told Han she wasn't just making small talk. Apprehension prickled between his shoulder blades. I've learned a lot, Han said, thinking of Crow. I still have plenty to learn. We sound like enemies meeting in the market, jousting for position, Han thought. He tried to think of something else to say. Didn't Nightwalker come with you? She shook her head. I came alone. He's busy organizing strategy for summer. We were already spread thin because of the problems along the border with Arden, and now there's a new crisis. That's why I came here to see you. No apology, then, Han thought, let alone a rekindled romance. Reed needs some advice, he asked, or is there trouble between the two of you? Bird frowned. You're different, she said. I don't know if I like you as well. What do you want, Bird? 
Hans said. I have things to do. Bird leaned forward, hands on her knees, her expression grave. We've received word that Queen Mariana has given way to pressure from the High Wizard and plans to name Princess Melanie as her heir. She sat back, dropping her hands into her lap and looking at Han as if she expected him to leap up and cry, Not while I live and breathe. Who's Princess Melanie again? Han asked, pretending ignorance. Bird drew her brows together in a frown. She's Princess Race's younger sister. Ah. Hmm. Well, what does Princess Race say about it? She's in hiding. She ran away back in midsummer on her name day. That seemed familiar. Oh, right. I heard she had a fight with the Queen. They tried to marry her off to Micah Bayar, the son of the High Wizard. Again, she looked at him expectantly, as if anticipating some violent reaction. Huh, Han thought. That's interesting. So poor Micah got left at the altar. Wish I'd known that yesterday. Why did the demon I care which princess is heir, Han said, long as the princesses aren't fighting about it. Princess Raysa is the true heir. She's Hanalia's line. We can't allow the wizard council to put a usurper on the throne. Han shrugged. They're all the same bloodline, right? Doesn't seem like it would make much difference. Bird rolled her eyes. Once they name Melanie Princess Heir, they'll marry her off to Micah Bayar. The Wizard Council will get what they couldn't get before. A wizard married to the Queen of the Fells. That's been forbidden since the breaking. This was interesting. He recalled what Rebecca had said, feeling grateful for her tutelage. Even if that happens, aren't there magical tethers the speakers use to control the High Wizard? Couldn't they use those on Micah? Bird snorted. They're not working very well on the current High Wizard. The Bayars must have found a way around them. Maybe they're using something from their stash of illegal magical tools, Han thought. He could mention that to Bird. Or not. We expect that the young Bayar will declare himself king. Bird said. King Micah. Han didn't like that much. He's here, you know, Micah Bayar. Here? Bird looked around the room, her hands straying to her blade. Well, he's not here right now, Han said. He used to live in this dormitory, though. Bird chewed on her lower lip. He can't marry Melanie if he's dead, she said. Han stared at her. You'd kill him just because you suspect that's what the Bayars are planning? Why are you taking his part? Bird demanded. Have you become friends down here in the Flatlands? Have you forgotten what... I don't forget anything, Han said, figuring she could take her pick from a range of meanings. But the world is full of wizards if they want to marry one off to the princess. Killing Micah Bayar won't solve your problem. If it comes down to killing... I think you should aim higher. He looked straight into her eyes, a challenge. Bird tightened her lips, but didn't respond. Do you have proof? Han went on, or is it just re-demonized theory? Nightwalker has a network of informants in the Vale. They tell him that there's to be an announcement very soon. Lord Demoni and Elena Sinestra are concerned too, Bird said, a little defensively. They believe it's time to bring the princess heir home, if a way can be found to do it safely. Han felt oddly removed now. He was a fly on the wall looking down at himself and Bird, a sharper with no money left on the table. Well, good luck with all of that, he said. Bird looked down at her hands, then pulled back her sleeve and picked at a scab on her forearm. She's nervous, Han realized. She doesn't know how to say what she's come to say. So, Han said, did you come here just to give the news? The demon I are requiring you to honor your agreement, Bird said, looking straight ahead. They're calling you home to the Fells to protect the Princess Heir and to join them in their fight against the Wizard Council. For a long moment, Han couldn't speak. His face felt frozen, his lips numb. What? he whispered. Now? I've only just started. You're needed now, Bird said, 
We can't allow the Wizard Council to put a puppet on the Grey Wolf throne. We'll go to war to prevent it. We need your help. Han shook his head. Nuh-uh. Our agreement was that the clans would sponsor my schooling at Odin's Ford in exchange for my help. We did, Bird said, though she still wouldn't meet his eyes. We've kept our part of the bargain. We would have preferred that you'd had more training, but we have no control over the Wizard Council and what they do. It's my own fault, Han thought. I should never have made a bargain with a traitor. It took him a moment to get his tongue unstuck. So let me make sure I understand. You mean to send me against Lord Bayar and the Wizard Council, mostly master-level wizards, with two semesters of training? You won't be alone, Bird said. The demon and I will work with you to- Wait a minute, Han said. You said you came for me, not Dancer? Bird nodded, still not looking at him. Not Dancer. Not that I want to bring him into this, but why just one of us? Bird toyed with the hilt of her knife. The demon eye, unlidded eye was engraved into the bone handle. Because the demon eye would like Fire Dancer to stay at school to continue with his studies. We know that your lack of training puts you at a disadvantage, so we hope that eventually Fire Dancer can better assist you in the future. If I'm still alive, Han growled. It's natural to be afraid, Hans alone, Bird said. Nightwalker says, Blood of the demon, Han growled. Don't quote read demon eye to me. I have my own reasons for going after the High Wizard. When I do, I'd like better odds. I wouldn't start a gang war like this against a ruthless opponent when I don't know the game, I'm outnumbered, and I have very few weapons. I'd like to win, and I'd like to survive. I don't think that's asking a lot. I'm sorry, Hanselone, Bird said, braiding and unbraiding the fringe on her carry bag. That is the message I was ordered to bring you. Is there a reply? Han remembered the night he'd agreed to the clan's sponsorship. He'd asked what would happen if he refused to carry out the terms of the agreement. Avril Lightfoot Demon Eye had told him that the clans would hunt him down and kill him. Would Bird be given that assignment, he wondered, glancing at her. Maybe she already had. Her face was a stony mask, but her lower lip quivered just a bit. She'd been sent to do this job on her own. If he refused, would one of them end up dead? Was that all Bird was to Nightwalker? An expendable tool? Just like Han was to the clan leadership. The clans were hedging their bets. If Han didn't survive this fight with the Wizard Council, they'd have Dancer in reserve hopefully better trained by then. Han's fingers found his amulet and closed around it. He sighed, feeling the welcome release of the magic building up within him. Dancer's my friend, Han said. What makes you think he'll agree to stay and let me go on my own? We won't tell him, Bird said. That's why I wanted to speak with you alone. If Dancer knows you're returning to the Fells to fight wizards, he'll insist on coming too. He's not stupid, Han said. Don't you think he'll figure it out? He knows about the deal I made with the clans. You show up out of the blue, we talk and leave together? Well, Bird cast about for a solution. We can make up a story. We can tell Dancer we're back together and you're returning with me to Demon Eye Camp. Dancer knows how I feel about the Demon Eye, Han said, not bothering to soften his speech and how the demon eye would react to that. He'll never believe that story. His mind churned furiously. He really didn't want Dancer, or Cat, coming with him, maybe throwing their lives away in a lost cause. Secondly, he didn't intend to be dragged back to the fells like a runaway child. He'd go on his own, on his own terms. I'll go alone, Han said. I'll make up a story. Say I have to go somewhere for one of the faculty. You'll stay here for at least a week to throw Dancer off the scent. By the time he realizes that I'm not coming back, it'll be too late for him to track me. Too late for you to track me either, he thought. Bird shook her head. I'm supposed to escort you to Marisa Pine's camp, 
she said. Nightwalker said, why is that? Han said softly, looking her in the eyes. Do you think I don't know the way? Or do you think I'll bolt? What did Nightwalker tell you to do if I refused to come? If I try to cut and run, are you expected to hunt me down? Bird licked her lips, speechless for once. I'll keep my word, Han said. I'm asking you to believe me. They sat looking at each other for a long moment. Then Bird nodded. All right, we'll do it your way, Hanselone. Just know that the demon I are unforgiving. And I, I'm risking a lot. So am I, Han said. Bird chewed her lower lip. Does anyone know you're working for us? Han shrugged. I didn't tell anyone. He paused, and when she said nothing else, he stood up. All right, I'm going out. I have some things to take care of. Tell Dancer I went to see Dean Abelard about a project. I'm going to spend the next couple of days in the library. Day after tomorrow, we'll have a nice evening together, just like old times. Then I'll go. Bird shifted in her seat, clasping her hands together. There's not much time. It'll take a while to travel to... Han struggled to control his temper. I get that. Look, I'd like to have a fighting chance. I want to research the Wizard Council and speak with some of the masters here before I go. Surely you can spare me that much, assuming I'm not just a throwaway. Bird stood also. Hanselone, she said, her face troubled, her eyes focused on his face. I'm sorry about the way things turned out for us. It wasn't much of an apology, but it was more than he'd expected. I'm sorry, too. Han put a hand on her shoulder, and she flinched away. I'll be back, he said, swiveling away from her. Snatching his cloak from the peg next to the door, he walked out. He strode down the street, headed for the river. He'd cross to the Wean House side and speak with the stableman about his horse, then go back to his place in Mistwork Tower and gather up some books and other items he wanted to take with him. He was distracted, making mental lists, thinking about all he needed to accomplish, and so his guard was down as he crossed Bridge Street into Weenhouse territory. As he passed a side street, someone grabbed his arm and yanked him into the space between two buildings. He struggled and kicked, trying to reach his amulet, but his attackers knew what they were doing. Two of them pinned his arms to his sides, holding him immobile. There was no sting of wizardry through the grip on his arms, though, and when he looked up, he found himself facing Corporal Byrne. The corporal's face was hard, intent, focused. Turning his head to either side, Han saw that he was being held fast by Halley and Talia, their faces set and grim. Blood of the demon, he thought. Just what I need, along with everything else. Being beaten up by Rebecca's jealous, um... Commander? Han remembered what he'd said to Rebecca at Solstice about Burn. There is a thing between you. I just don't know what kind of thing it is. Why would Halley and Talia be in on it? If anything, they'd encouraged him to walk out with Rebecca. Hey now, he said, trying to pull free. What's this all about? Have you seen her? Burn demanded. Have you seen Rebecca? He looked scruffy and haggard, as if he'd neither shaved nor slept in days. Rebecca? Han shook his head. I've not seen her since we, uh, uh, since the last time I saw you, he said. Up in, up in a room. Byrne stuck his hand under Han's chin, shoving his head back against the wall and practically cutting off his air supply. Are you sure? Are you sure you haven't seen her? His eyes narrowed. What happened to your face? Have you been in a fight? This wasn't like Byrne to manhandle a prisoner. Let go of me, Han said evenly, and we'll talk. I'm not guilty of anything, all right? Byrne stared into Han's eyes for a long moment, then let go, nodding to Talia and Hallie. They let go also, but stood close in case he tried to make a break for it. We were supposed to meet for tutoring last night, Han said. She didn't show. 
I thought maybe you'd restricted her to quarters, or whatever you sword danglers call it. But you didn't come looking for her, Byrne pointed out. Han shook his head. After last time, I wasn't sure what kind of welcome I'd get at Grindel. He rubbed his arms where Talia and Hallie had gripped them. And I got this face during a... Uh, magical practicum. Why? Rebecca's missing? Since when? Nobody's seen her since yesterday afternoon, Byrne said. Her things are still at the dormitory, but her horse is gone. Since yesterday? Han rubbed his chin, wondering if Byrne kept such a tight leash on all of his cadets. When she missed our meeting, I assumed she wasn't allowed to come, she didn't want to come, or she's mad at me. Byrne shook his head as if Han were a hopeless idiot. She's in danger, he said, his gray eyes glittering like agates. I need to find her. He fingered the hilt of his sword. Where have you been last night and today? Han thought back. Well, he'd fought in a pitched battle in Edeon, had it out with the Bayars, found out his ex-girlie and his best friend were walking out together, and been given a suicide assignment by another former girlfriend. I was at my dormitory, Han said. I've been there pretty much the whole time except for that practicum with Dean Abelard. I have people who can vouch for me. Byrne glared into his face a moment more, then shook his head. I'm sorry, he said, rubbing his forehead wearily. Any idea where she might have gone? Is there anyone else you've seen her with? Could she have gone riding with someone? Han shook his head. We met for tutoring twice a week, but the other night was the first time I, uh, saw where she stayed. Do you know Micah Bayar? Byrne asked abruptly. The hair stood up on the back of Han's neck. I know him, Han said. Why? He's gone too, Byrne said. He and his sister and cousins have cleared out and left Odin's Ford, even though exams aren't over yet. Any idea where they've gone? Han shook his head. We aren't close, he said, his stomach nodding up. But why is that important? I mean, Rebecca used to work for him, but not anymore. Byrne just looked at him as if he didn't have an answer for that. Not an answer he wanted to give, anyway. Han seized hold of Byrne's lapels with both hands and jerked him closer. I said, why is that important? What about Bayar? What do you know? Hey, Hallie said, putting her hand on Han's arm. You don't touch the commander. She didn't raise her voice, but she meant business. Han reluctantly let go. Why would Micah Bayar have something to do with Rebecca's disappearance? He persisted, looking from Byrne to Talia to Hallie. Memories trickled back, how Rebecca had begged him not to tell the Bayars she was in Odin's Ford. How she didn't want to cross to the Mistwork side for fear of running into them. How Han asked her if she ever went out and she'd said no. A terrible possibility occurred to him. Did Bayar hurt her when she worked for him? Han said, his heart thudding against his ribcage. Was that why she was so afraid of him? Byrne's face might have been a stone slab. Ask all you want. I'm not going to tell you any more than this. If she's disappeared, he might have something to do with it. Rivulets of flame ran along Han's hands and arms, and he gripped his amulet to discharge it. He recalled his words to Bayar when they'd parted. You Bayars need to learn that you can't have everything you want. I'm going to teach you. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe the Bayars would always get everything they wanted. Everything Han cared about, including Rebecca. Had Micah found out they were walking out together? Would he go that far to get revenge on Han? It seemed like destiny, a bad dream repeated relentlessly. Where would he take her? Han demanded. Bayar, I mean. That's what I'm trying to find out, Byrne said. He squinted at Han. There's something different about you, he whispered, almost to himself. Something that reminds me of... He caught himself. If you see Rebecca, 
If you hear anything that might be useful, find me, no matter what time it is. He motioned to Halley and Talia. Han watched the trio of cadets walk away. All the way to the stables, Han chewed over Rebecca's disappearance like a tough piece of meat. She'd seemed stressed and unhappy the last time he'd seen her, worried about her mother, talking about going home. Maybe she'd up and left. But would she leave her belongings behind? No. Was it possible that Byrne himself was responsible for Rebecca's disappearance and was trying to deflect blame? After all, he was the one who'd driven Han off at sword point. No, Han hadn't lived as long as he had by misjudging people. Byrne was a hopeless liar, and he'd seemed genuinely distraught. How could Han leave Odin's ford with Rebecca missing? Han paid his bill at the stable and made arrangements to have Ragger and Simon, his spare horse, reshod and ready to travel later in the week. Don't give up the stalls. I'll be back, he said, to cover his tracks in case anybody asked. I'm going to Tamron Court to do some research. The stableman grunted, making it obvious he didn't care and probably wouldn't remember if anyone did ask. As he walked back toward the bridge, Han saw a crowd of cadets in their dirtback uniforms outside the Wean Hall Library, studded here and there with the colors of faculty robes, Wean House and Mistwork. He saw Dean Abelard with a group of Mistwork masters and proficients, apparently directing an investigation of the grounds. The crowd hummed with excitement, like a mob on Chats Hill on execution day. As Han looked on, Two healers carried a body wrapped in a blanket down the steps of the library, followed by a clutch of provost guards. No, he thought, his heart stalling in his chest. Oh, no. Han pushed and shoved his way through the onlookers, drawing scowls and curses along the way, until he stood next to the walkway as the healers passed by. He grabbed the sleeve of one of the provosts. Ma'am, who is it? Who's dead? The provost ripped her arm free. Leave go, boy. We'll issue a statement. But my friend, she's missing, Han said, since yesterday. The provost stopped so suddenly, the person behind her practically ran into her. She turned off the path, pulling Han by the arm. What's your friend's name? She asked. Rebecca Morley. Come with me. The guard pushed Han back toward the library. As he passed Abelard, she looked up and fixed him with a piercing gaze. They walked through the heavy double doors and up the steps. Around and around they climbed, while Han's heart sank lower and lower. Finally, they reached the top of the staircase and threaded their way through a warren of small reading rooms. The door to one room stood ajar. In there, the guard said. Han halted just inside the door, half sick with dread. The room was small, with a desk under a window on one wall, a fireplace on the other, a work table facing the door. Books and papers lay scattered over the surface of the table. A lamp lay smashed on the floor, and bits of glass glittered in the sunlight from the window. Blood splattered the wooden floor between the door and the table. A stocky man in Wienhouse master's robe stood looking out the window. Blood splattered the wooden floor between the door and the table. A stocky man in Wean House master's robes stood looking out the window. Master Askell, the provost said. This boy says he's friends with Rebecca Morley. Master Askell turned toward Han, his broad face etched by years of sun and completely impassive. He took in Han's attire, the amulet at his neck. Who are you? he asked, without preamble. Han Alistair, newling at Miss Workhouse, Han said. How do you know Rebecca? Askell asked. She was tutoring me, Han said. We met back home. Askell pointed at the work table. See if you recognize the materials on the table as Rebecca's. Sand and glass gridded under Han's boots. Blotting sand was also scattered across the tabletop, the jar overturned. Here were pages of notes in Rebecca's familiar, angular handwriting. Here was her ornate pen and enameled ink bottle. 
Han shut his eyes and swallowed hard. Blood and bones, he thought. Bloody, bloody bones. Would the carnage in his life never stop? These are hers, Han said, looking at Askel, his voice thick with despair. The master held up a dagger by its tip. We found this lying next to the wall, he said. That's hers too, Han said. He crossed the room to take a closer look. There was no blood on the blade, so Rebecca hadn't gotten any back. I should have hushed Bayar when I'd had the chance, he thought. I should have stuck with what I know, street rules. You better send someone for Commander Byrne, Han said hollowly. He's on his way. Askel set Rebecca's blade on the table. How did she die? Han asked, leaning his hands on the stone sill and staring out the window. What killed her? Would Bayar have been so arrogant as to use wizardry? When Askel didn't answer, Han turned to face him, leaning his backside against the window frame. The master looked perplexed. Are you talking about Rebecca? He asked. Well, yes, Han said. I saw them carrying out the body. Askel shook his head. We found four bodies, in fact. Two men, two women. None of them students, though they all wore cadet uniforms. One was in here. He seems to have smashed his head against the table during a struggle. The other three were outside, and they appear to have been killed with wizardry. What? Hans stared at Askel. That doesn't make sense. Askel shrugged. There are many things in this world that don't make sense, he said. Rebecca may be dead, but we did not find her body. Chapter 36 Detours Raisa opened her eyes to darkness and motion and the stench of damp wool. She felt dizzy and confused, her head pounded, and her mouth tasted like the dregs of a bad barrel of cider. She tried to raise her arms, but they were wrapped tight in fabric, confined close to her body, and a hood was pulled up over her head so she couldn't see. She was on horseback, riding double. She could feel the heat of another body against her back. She struggled to free her arms so she could yank off the hood, and Micah Bayar slid an arm around her waist, pulling her tightly against him. You're finally awake, he said, his lips close to her ear. Careful you don't fall off. We're aboard Raider, and it's a long way to the ground. As the rest of her senses awakened, she became aware of the sound of horses in motion around her, hooves on a hard-packed road, the squeak of saddle leather, the murmur of voices. Raisa shook her head from side to side, trying to dislodge the hood. That set her head to pounding with the headache typical of a turtleweed hangover. For an awful moment, she thought she might spew over the both of them. Where are we? she asked when the danger had passed. We're north of Odin's Ford, on the road to Fetter's Ford, Micah said. He tugged the hood back so she could see, and the fresh air helped. They rode through the dense forest, the canopy of trees nearly meeting overhead. Rasa looked around. Switcher followed behind on a lead line, loaded with supplies. Ahead, she could see the rest of the party, four other riders who must be the Mander brothers, Fiona, and one other wizard. Who's that? she asked, with Fiona and the Manders. Will Mathis, Micah said. He asked to come north with us. Raisa knew Will from court. He was sloppy and good-natured, unusual for a wizard. Two years older than the Bayar twins, he'd been in love with Fiona for as long as Raisa could remember. They each led a spare horse, carrying baggage and supplies. Off to the right, through the trees, Raisa caught glimpses of water. That would be the east branch of the Tamron River. What day is it? she asked. Micah laughed softly. You haven't been sleeping that long, your highness. It's the day after we met in the Wean Hall Library. We left in the middle of the night. 
I expect we'll be four days to fetters. Will you... Will we head up through Demon Eye Vale, then? she asked. That would provide another opportunity if she could somehow get away. No, Micah said. We'll go east, skirting the mountains, and up through Delphi. I have no desire to meet up with any of the Demon Eye. He snapped his reins, and their horse picked up the pace to catch up with the others. Even though Rasa was small, Raider was feeling the burden of carrying two riders. Was there any chance Eamon would come after her? It seemed unlikely. Until now, she'd managed to avoid Micah Bayar and the other wizards from Fell's March. Eamon would have no reason to suspect them. Maybe he'd even think she'd decided to go home on her own. No doubt he'd be searching for her, but he'd have no idea where to look. Would his magical connection tell him she was in trouble? Might it lead him to her? She prayed it would, but worried what would happen if it did. They stopped for lunch in a small clearing between the road and the river. They didn't build a fire. Rasa, Micah, and Fiona stood among the trees eating cold meat, bread, and cheese, and washing it down with cider, while Will and the Mander brothers grained the horses and led them down to the river to water them. Now that I'm awake, maybe I should ride Switcher, so Raider doesn't tire, Rasa said. Oh no, your highness, I'm enjoying our time together, and hope you are too, Micah said, brushing his lips across her cheek. I think Raider understands. Micah might be arrogant, but he'd never been stupid. It was a cloudy, cool spring day, the air so laden with moisture it was like breathing underwater. Rasa shivered, her skin pebbled with goosebumps, though it wasn't that cold. She swiped wet tendrils of hair off her face, feeling unsettled. Fiona did her best to ignore Rasa's presence, but her disapproval was palpable. Clearly, she believed the assassins should have been allowed to do their job. Rasa stared out into the surrounding forest, trying to ignore Fiona. The dry bread and cheese were hard to choke down. Shadows moved under the trees. She blinked, and they were still there, gray shapes sliding through the mist, gray wolves. It seemed she was seeing them more and more, but maybe that was a reflection of the way her life was going. Were they there because of her present predicament? or did they signify some new threat? The wolves surrounded her, tongues lolling, ears flat, bumping their great heads against her middle, nearly knocking her over. Great lot of good you do me, she grumbled. Why can't I teach you to attack wizards on command? Excuse me, Rasa, Micah said. He touched her arm, looking a little concerned. Were you speaking to me? Nothing. It was nothing. She swiveled, scanning the woods around them. Even in spring, with some trees not yet leafed out, Tamron Forest seemed thick and oppressive, crowding in on all sides. Too close. Is something wrong, your highness? Micah asked. You're not eating. Do you hear anything? Rasa asked. The forest around them was silent. Even the birds had gone eerily quiet. The hair stood up on her arms. Micah, she said, putting her hand on his arm. Let's go. Something's wrong. I think we'd better... Her voice failed as soldiers stepped out of the forest on all sides, crossbows cocked and ready. Put your hands in the air! Now! shouted a young man with dark hair and mud-brown eyes. A red officer's scarf was knotted around his neck, and a red hawk was emblazoned on his tunic. Micah and Fiona glanced at each other, then slowly raised their hands. The others, including Rasa, followed suit. The soldiers were clad in wool uniforms that had seen hard use. Some wore mismatched armor pieces, others had none. Some bore the Red Hawk, others were unmarked. From their haggard appearances, they'd been on the road for months, could this be one of the roving bands of mercenaries Eamon had warned her about? Don't even think of touching those jinx pieces, the officer went on. Micah leaned toward Fiona. 
He's gifted, he said out of the corner of his mouth. I noticed, she snapped. What is the meaning of this? Fiona demanded, glaring at the officer. Who are you? Collect their jinx pieces and any other weapons you find, the officer said to his men, ignoring Fiona. Don't touch the pendants directly. Hold them by their chains. The soldiers went from person to person and collected the wizard's amulets, daggers, and swords. When he came to Rasa, she shook her head. I don't have an amulet, she said, nor any weapons. Sorry. The soldier glanced at his officer, who said, She won't have one. She's not gifted. The soldier patted her down anyway, coming up empty-handed, of course, because she'd lost her belt dagger in the library. When they were all disarmed, the officer motioned to his men to put down their crossbows, though they kept their hands on their swords. Let me introduce myself. I'm Marin Karn, commander of the army of the King of Arden. Which king, Raysa wanted to ask, but didn't. Arden? Micah tilted his head. But we're in Tamron. Arden is across the river. Damn, Commander Karn said, grinning. Guess we went astray again, boys. The other soldiers snorted with laughter. That doesn't make sense, Fiona said. You're a wizard, but wizardry is forbidden in Arden. You burn wizards and- Aye, Karn said, nodding. That's so. The church has strict rules against it. Fiona frowned. Then how can there be gifted soldiers in the king of Arden's army? She persisted. Karn shook his head. Oh, no, we'd never admit to that. Most who come up against us don't survive to tell tales. Those that survive don't remember, and only wizards can recognize others with the gift. So you're using wizardry in the Ardenine Wars, Rasa whispered. We're just getting started, Karn said. We've more than a dozen jinxlingers. Many are young, recruited on their way to Odin's Ford. Most haven't had any training. Some don't have amulets. That's where you come in. What do you mean? Micah said. I'm guessing you're students from Odin's Ford. You've been getting top-notch training at the academy there. We want you to teach our recruits spellcasting. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Micah said glancing at Rasa. We have pressing business in the fells, and we can't risk getting involved in your civil war. Karn seemed unfazed. Think hard before you say no, he said. We've hundreds of soldiers camped this side of the river, and an army several thousand strong on the other side. He looked toward the river and came to attention. Here comes the king now. A small group of men walked toward them from the riverbank. Four burly men, armored up and carrying weapons, surrounded a slender man in a tunic emblazoned with the Red Hawk's signia, silver gauntlets and breastplate, a sword belted at his waist. He wore a circlet of gold on his light brown hair, and his blue eyes were pale blue and cold as the ice in Invader's Bay. It was Prince Gerard Montan, the youngest of the warring Montan brothers, Race's unsuccessful suitor at her name-day party. Hannah Leah in chains, Raysa muttered. Could things get any worse? She yanked her hood over her head and stared at the ground, hoping he wouldn't recognize her. Surely he wouldn't, not here, so out of context. Why was Gerard Montan in Tamron? And why did he have his army collected just across the border? He should be back in Arden's court, facing off with his brothers. Karn bowed to his king. Your Majesty, we have five jinxflingers for mist work. Good, Montan said, his eyes flicking over Micah and the others. Have you explained to them the services we require? The answer is no, Fiona said, straightening to her full height. Now release us immediately. Montan moved, quicker than light, smashing his gauntleted arm into Fiona's face and knocking her to the ground. Micah leaped forward, but Will Mathis was closer. With a cry of rage, he sprang at the Prince of Arden, who drew his sword and calmly ran him through. Will and Montan ended face to face, a foot separating them, Will's eyes bulging wide in amazement. 
Then Montan shoved him away with his booted foot, freeing his sword. Will teetered, then fell backward, hit the ground, and lay still, blood pooling around him. Will, Fiona cried, trying to scramble to her feet, but Micah knelt next to her, gripping her shoulders and holding her in place. No, he said fiercely. You can't help him. Does anyone else wish to have a conversation about this? Montan asked. No one moved and no one spoke. Raisa had to bite her lip to keep her acid tongue in check. Wizard or not, Will had always been among the best of the breed. More than that, he was a citizen of the Fells, and so her responsibility. Montan paced back and forth in front of them, his sword in his hand. Now that we understand each other, perhaps we can do business. Captain Karn has convinced me that jinxlingers will be useful in bringing this long war to a conclusion. If he's right, it may be that we'll only require your services for a limited time. I'll never let them go, Raisa thought. Gerard Montan will always have use for an army. Like I said, think hard before you say no. Karn ran his eyes over the captives. So, what'll it be? All right, Micah said abruptly, standing. We will teach your charm casters what we know and aid you in any way we can. The sooner you achieve victory, the sooner we can be on our way. Bear in mind that we are just first years, so our knowledge is limited. He walked forward and put a hot hand on Race's shoulder. I would, however, ask you to release our servant. She's not gifted and so would be of no help to you. Raisa froze, scarcely breathing. Was Micah really trying to engineer her release? She turned her head slightly so she could see his face. His expression didn't change, but she felt the pressure of his fingers as he squeezed her shoulder. Your servant, is she? Montan said. He looked at Karn, and he nodded. She's not gifted, your majesty. I wondered why she was traveling with them. Montan restored his sword to its scabbard, not bothering to wipe off the blood. Raisa kept her head down, peering up through her lashes at the Prince of Arden. He toyed with the hilt of his sword, his lower lip caught behind his teeth. Well, he said finally, let's have a look at you. He reached toward Raisa and tugged back her hood. Raisa lifted her head, and their eyes met. They stood staring at each other, and then Gerard Montan smiled in his bone-chilling way. Race's heart plummeted. Ah, Karn, he said softly. You have overlooked the greatest prize of all. Karn looked from Raisa to Montan. What do you mean, your grace? Who is she? Montan kept his eyes fixed on Race's face. Taking hold of her hand, he raised it to his lips. Princess Raisa Anna Mariana, he murmured. Welcome to the new kingdom of Arden. Karn looked from Raisa to Montan. She's a princess, Montan nodded. We met at her debut party nearly a year ago. She is the heir to the throne of the Phils. His eyes raked over her. She was dressed quite differently last time I saw her, but there's no mistake in her. His grip tightened about her wrist. But why would the princess heir of the Phils ride through Tamron with wizardlings? Raisa knew there was no point in continuing to deny her identity. I've been attending the academy at Odin's Ford, she said. I'm traveling home for the summer. Montan shook his head incredulously. The Phils would send a gently bred woman through Tamron with no more guard than this? He gestured toward the Bayars and the Manders. Tamron is not at war, your highness, Raisa said, looking him in the eye with a confidence she didn't feel. I wouldn't expect to be waylaid by brigands along the way. She nodded toward Will's prone body. You've already murdered one member of my guard. Now that you know who I am, I expect you will allow us to continue on our journey unmolested. Montan smiled, his face lighting with triumph. 
Ah, no, your highness, he said. That's much too risky, as you've seen. He jerked her toward him, cupping her chin in his hand. I think it's time we continued our conversation about an alliance between Arden and the Fells. An alliance cemented by our marriage. He smiled. I'll have Tamron, Arden, and the Fells, all the riches of the mountain mines, and access to an unlimited supply of jinxflingers and magical objects. Eventually, we'll rule the Seven Realms. That will never happen, Rasa said, lifting her chin. Watch me. Montan handed Rasa off to Karn. Take these wizardlings and the princess back across the river and keep a close watch on them. Bring their horses. We'll talk more tonight. The Prince of Arden straightened his silver gauntlets. Ah, Karn, this changes everything. Karn gripped Race's arm and dragged her toward the river's edge. The other Ardenine soldiers herded Micah and the others after her. Snick! A soldier fell just behind her, both hands clutching at an arrow sticking out of the middle of his chest. Snick, 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 the sound of crossbows. More soldiers fell. Your Highness, take cover! Karn let go his hold on Rasa and thrust his bulk in front of Montan, who pawed at his sword. The Ardenine soldiers scrambled for cover as a troop of horse soldiers exploded from the forest, threatening to overrun them. Riderless horses ran in all directions. Rasa sprinted for the trees, toward the road and away from the river. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Micah grab Fiona's hand and drag her behind a fallen tree. The cavalry wore a signia of purple and gray heron, wings spread, landing on water. The emblem of the king of Tamron. To me, Montan shouted. More Ardenine soldiers appeared at the run, coming from the direction of the river, a pitched battle erupted, the Red Hawk of Arden against the Heron of Tamron. Rasa raced blindly through the forest, leaping over fallen trees and other obstacles, meaning to gain as much distance from the fight as she could. Montan was preparing to invade Tamron, that much was clear. If Arden's thousands of soldiers crossed the river, there could be no doubt as to the outcome of this skirmish. Weaponless as she was, she had few illusions about the contribution she could make. Looking back over her shoulder for signs of pursuit, she nearly ran headlong into the side of a horse. Analia in chains, she said, skidding to a halt. It was Fiona's horse, Ghost, a tall, spirited gray stallion with four white stockings. Rasa leaped forward and caught hold of his reins. The horse laid back his ears and shied away from her hand, but Rasa still managed to swarm up and into the saddle. The stirrups were set far too long, but Rasa clung to his back like a thistle and drove her heels into his sides. Ghost extended his long neck, accelerating into a gallop, twisting and turning through the trees. He probably doesn't even know I'm up here, after Fiona, Rasa thought. Pressing herself flat against the stallion's neck to avoid being unhorsed by low branches, she gave him his head and let him run. She needed to put as much distance as possible between herself and those who might soon be chasing after her. That meant riding straight west as far as the road. The traffic on the road would hide evidence of her passing, and she'd make good time, whichever direction she chose. Which way, she wondered. She had Fiona's saddlebags, but no idea what was in them. She had a little money in the purse still tucked inside her coat. If Micah and Fiona got free of the battle, they would guess she'd return south to Odin's Ford and rejoin Eamon and the others. They wouldn't expect her to travel north on her own, especially after what had just happened. Montan, on the other hand, might expect her to continue north, making for home, or west to Tamron's seat for sanctuary. Hopefully the Tamron army would keep them occupied for a time. Surely Montan wouldn't chase after her with an invasion underway. No doubt he'd continue on to the capital. So north it was. If she could make it as far as Fetter's Ford, perhaps she could get word to Captain Byrne to send an escort. 
They'd either go north through Demon Eye Vale or east via Marisa Pines, depending on the news at that time. Ghost needed no encouragement to leave the clamor of battle behind. Raisa gave him direction with her knees and hands, while her mind picked over events of the past and prospects for the future. She longed for the simple safety of childhood, the ability to give over responsibility to the Captain Burns of the world, sheltering under their protection. But adulthood slipped up on you, she thought. It was forced on you whether you liked it or not. She had changed. She wasn't the same person who had run away with Eamon Byrne ten short months ago. She was more able, but less confident. She was better equipped to judge people and less convinced of her ability to do so. When she'd left the Fells, she thought of people as being sorted into lots, good and bad, brave and cowardly. Now she realized that there were bits of both in most people, and which elements prevailed often depended on circumstance. Micah Bayar, for all his faults, was a mixture of good and bad. She might be dead at an assassin's hand if not for him. He had tried to free her when they were captured by Gerard Montan. But he presented different faces to different people, and his efforts to keep her alive were likely selfish at their root. Raised on romance, Raisa would have said that it was impossible to love two men at once, that there was one true love for every person, if you could only find it. But it wasn't true. She still loved Eamon Byrne. Her feelings about him were too raw for close examination. And she loved Han Alistair, if she understood love at all. Would she ever see him again? And if so, could they build from a relationship based on a lie? And what did she expect to build on that shaky foundation? By the way, Alistair, I've been lying to you for more than a year. I'm actually a member of the royal family you despise. There's no future for us, but I'd still like to be friends. Would Raisa herself be satisfied with friendship when the memory of Han's kisses and caresses haunted her? Would Eamon and Han be able to set aside their antipathy and put the pieces of her disappearance together? Her mother was a weak queen, but she'd been mired down by circumstance. Maybe when Raisa returned, there would be a way to connect with her, to join with her, to help her, and become a better queen herself some day. Ahead, she saw the break in the trees that meant they were coming up on the road. Raining ghost in with some difficulty, Raisa slowed their pace to a walk. Pausing in the last fringe of trees, she looked up and down the road and saw no one. Let's go, she said, applying her heels. We need to go a lot farther before we rest. They turned north, setting a more sustainable pace. After nearly a year, she was going home. The decision had been forced on her, but more and more, she believed it was the right one. Chapter 37 A Parting of the Ways Han had meant to spend his last days at Odin's Ford preparing for his mission in the north. Instead, he spent it desperately searching for clues about Rebecca's disappearance. The dead at the Wean Hall Library had been strangers to Odin's Ford. None were wizards. They'd been seen around the academy for several days, asking questions. Either they carried nothing in their pockets, or whoever had killed them had stripped them of identification. Han slipped into Micah's dormitory, familiar from his many visits, and tossed their rooms. They'd departed in a hurry, leaving many of their belongings behind. It couldn't be a coincidence. Had they left because they'd murdered her, or had they taken her with them? No matter how Han put it together, it didn't make sense. Three of the dead had been killed with wizardry. Had Rebecca been witness to the killings and been killed or carried off for that reason? Han walked over to Grindel Hall the morning before he planned to leave. The dormitory was a hive of activity. Cadets running up and down stairs, packing their belongings. Byrne met with him in the common room. The blue jacket had lost some of his military edge. His eyes were ringed with dark circles, and he hadn't shaved in several days. Looks like you're leaving, Han said. 
Rebecca is no longer in the area, Byrne said. I believe she's gone north. We received a report from Tamron Seat that someone resembling Rebecca was caught in a skirmish with Ardenine forces along the border between Tamron and Arden. We're riding to Tamron Seat to investigate. It's possible she's there, in the capital. Han hesitated, then went ahead and said it. You think she's alive, then? he said. She's alive, Byrne said, as if he hadn't a doubt. He ran his hands through his hair. But I need to find her. If she's in Tamron, she's in grave danger. Gerard Montan has invaded from the east. He's got the capital encircled, demanding their surrender. And you're going into that? Han shook his head. You're a meddlesome one, Corporal. He paused. If Bayar carried Rebecca off and she's still alive, I'd guess he'd take her back to the Fells, wouldn't you? And if she left on her own, she'd head home too. Byrne nodded. If we don't find her in Tamron, I'll keep heading north, looking for signs she went that way. If I find her trail, I'll follow it. Otherwise, I'll cross into the Fens and enter the Fells at Westgate. If you hear anything, send a message there. I will, Han said. But I came to let you know that I'm going back to the Fells, too. I didn't want you to think I'd kick town on you. Which way will you go? Byrne asked. I'll go north to Fetter's Ford, then east to Delphi, Han said. I'll search for Rebecca that way, ending up at Marisa Pine's camp. If you find anything or hear anything from the capital, send word to me there. After a moment's hesitation, Byrne extended his hand. Be careful, he said. Han gripped the offered hand. You too, he said. See you at home. Abelard sent a runner for Han in the afternoon. When he entered her office, she stood staring out the window. Did you know that the Bayars have left school? She asked without preamble. I heard, Han said. They left in a hurry, with their cousins and Will Mathis. He told her what he'd found at their dormitory. Abelard turned around and looked at him, her expression unreadable. Sit, she motioned to a chair. He sat. That incident at the Wien Hall Library, those people that were killed, Han said. I think the Bayars had something to do with it. Do you? Abelard toyed with a small, jewel-encrusted dagger. Sunlight reflected off it, sending sparkles racing over the walls. Why would you think that? They disappeared the same night, along with a friend of mine. Friend? Abelard tilted her head. Who? A Wean House cadet, Rebecca Morley. She used to work for the Bayars. She disappeared the same time they did. I don't know her, Abelard said, dismissing Rebecca. But it is likely the Bayars had to do with the killings at the library in an indirect way. She paused, those gray-green eyes assessing him. The four dead are all assassins in the employ of Airy House. Assassins? Han rubbed his head as if he could reshuffle his thoughts and be dealt a better hand. Why would they come here? And who would have killed them? I thought perhaps you could tell me, Abelard said, running her thumb over the honed edge of the blade. Me? Han shook his head. I'm not following. Abelard gave him a don't-try-to-fool-me kind of look. They worked for the Bayars, she said. They were killed with wizardry. It finally clanked into place. You think I did it? Who in Odin's Ford would the Bayars want to kill? Abelard said. An attack on the High Wizard can't go unanswered forever. She shrugged. And who might be most likely to survive such an attack? Han leaned forward, hands on his knees, willing her to believe him. Look. I don't know why they were here, or who hushed them, but I had nothing to do with it. It speaks for your reputation that Lord Bayar sent a team of four to do the job. I think that when Micah and Fiona found out what happened to their father's assassins, they decided to leave before you came after them. Han shook his head. It wasn't me. Like I told you, 
My friend Rebecca disappeared from the library where the one assassin was found. Perhaps she saw something she shouldn't have, Abelard said. Hans stood. This is a waste of time, he said, fighting back fury. If you think I would have had anything to do with... Sit down, Alistair, Abelard said. It's in your best interest to hear me out. Reluctantly, he sat, arms folded, glaring at her. She rolled her eyes. Oh, don't look so distraught. There was nothing at the scene to tie it to you, and I must say I'm more impressed than ever with your abilities. Han gave up. There was no way he'd persuade the dean that he hadn't done the four, not when it all fit together so well and he had no other story to tell. Well, I think the Bayars left town for another reason, he said, and that's what we should be looking into. Abelard nodded, tapping the desk with her blade. You may be right. I would prefer to keep young Micah Bayar under my eye, since he is central to his father's ambitions. I'm going back, too, Han announced. Tomorrow. I won't be here for the summer after all. He tipped his chin up and looked her in the eyes. Propping her elbows on the desk, Abelard laced her fingers, resting her chin on her hands. If you're thinking of taking revenge on the Bayars, I would advise you not to do anything rash, she said. Never worry, Han said. If I take revenge, I'll do it with great forethought and deliberation. The dean laughed. You are amazing, Alistair. Your clothing, your speech. You've gone from street rat to courtier in less than a year. She paused. I'd advise you to stay. If you go back now, you'll be on your own. I can't offer much protection from here. I'm going anyway, Han said. Abelard shrugged. I do have allies, however, and I will tell them to watch out for you. I intend to come back home in the summer or fall for an extended stay. Matters are accelerating such that I believe they require my close personal attention. Abelard reached into her desk drawer and pulled out a heavy purse. She plunked it on the desk in front of Han. This will tide you over in the meantime. The dean went on to give Han a list of jobs to do and people to meet after he arrived. The important thing is to keep the Bayars from further consolidating their influence with the queen, she said. I'm told that in the absence of the Princess Rasa, they hope to see Melanie named heir and married off to Micah. It may be why he's returned home so suddenly. You must do everything you can to prevent this. Everything? Han raised an eyebrow. Abelard smiled. Goodbye, Alistair. Stay alive until I get there. Han's head spun as he descended the stairs. Was it possible that Micah Bayar was headed home for a wedding? And if he was, what could he, Han, do about it? Assassinate the bride and groom? Plan a massacre at the marriage feast? Han had too many gang lords. Cat and Dancer helped Han carry his saddlebags and panniers down so he could load his horses. I still don't understand why Abelard is sending you to Tamron's seat, Dancer said. Even if they have a large library, they can't have much of a magical collection. It's more about politics, Han said. I need to keep her happy if I want to come back to school in the fall. Han scratched Ragger between the ears, and the pony laid back his ears and showed his teeth, ill-tempered as usual. You like being lazy, sucking up hay in a warm barn, don't you? Han murmured. Well, now you have to get to work again. Both of us do. There had been little time for riding over the past few months. Now they'd get reacquainted. Can't you at least stay until Dig... Nightbird leaves, Dancer said. She'll be gone by the time you come back. Nightbird and I haven't got much to say to each other these days, Han said. Their evening together had been awkward at best. Too many secrets divided them. She came all this way to see us, Dancer said. I think she's getting used to the idea that we're wizards. I mean, I think she's sorry for the way she reacted when we... The demon and I are just like everyone else. They ditch their high-minded principles whenever it's convenient, Han said. 
Dancer frowned, his eyes searching Han's face. This is Bird we're talking about, he said. You should give her a chance. Han didn't really want to have a heart-to-heart -heart about Digging Bird, Night Bird, whoever she wanted to be these days. Anyway, you've been working on amulets since exams were over, too, Han said. I have to work on Flash in the summer, Dancer said. It's not part of the curriculum at Miss Workhouse. Cat had been all twitchy during this long exchange, flinging back her hair, pacing back and forth, signaling that she had something to say. You should let me come with you, she said. I can't watch your back if your back is in Tamron and I'm here. I want you to keep looking for Rebecca, Han said, strapping down his bedroll. Keep asking questions. See if anyone knows anything. There's a chance somebody saw something. And watch Dancer's back. That's what you should do while I'm gone. When everything was in readiness, Han leaned back against his pony, strangely reluctant to leave. There needed to be places like this, places to read and write and study and argue and debate with all different kinds of people and not have to look over your shoulder all the time. Places where the desire for knowledge overwhelmed boundaries and differences. It was part of the reason he'd resisted hushing Micah during those first few weeks when his anger had threatened to spill over into violence. His first task was to make it to Marisa Pine's camp without getting killed or recruited into somebody's army. He'd look for Rebecca along the way. Corporal Byrne had seemed convinced she was alive, but Han couldn't conjure up much hope. Once back home, he'd find the Bayars and make them talk. Han embraced Dancer, then Cat, and mounted Ragger. Travel safely, Dancer said, in clan. Return to our hearth. Han nodded, wondering if he would ever return to Odin's Ford. The End You've been listening to The Exiled Queen by Cinda Williams Chima, narrated by Carol Monda. This book is copyrighted 2010 by Cinda Williams Chima. This recording is copyrighted 2011 by Recorded Books. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Enchanted Glass by Diana Wynne Jones, narrated by Stephen Crossley. When Andrew Hope's magician grandfather dies, he leaves his house and field of care to his grandson, who spent much of his childhood at the house. Andrew has forgotten much of this, but he remembers the very strong-minded staff and the fact that his grandfather used to put the inedibly large vegetables on the roof of the shed, where they'd have vanished in the morning. He also remembers the very colorful stained glass window in the kitchen door, which he knows it is important to protect. Into this mix comes young Aidan Kane, who turns up from the orphanage, asking for safety. Exactly who he is and why he's there is unclear, but a strong connection between the two becomes apparent. There is a mystery to be solved, and nothing is as it appears to be. But nobody can solve the mystery until they find out exactly what it is. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. Call us toll-free or log on to recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers, order another recorded book, or to read author interviews and narrator profiles. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.